good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, attending today's public hearing that is a joint hearing between the Department of Development or the Development Committee uh, as well as the Public Safety Committee. Uh, so on behalf of Council Member Mills and I, uh, we welcome everyone here. Uh, I'd like just to start off of, of, of thanking everyone for attending. This is a great turnout. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, having a three o'clock hearing, I understand that a lot of you all have uh, day responsibilities that uh, this is uh, due to scheduling conflicts, getting close to the holidays, availability of council due to council chambers, due to uh, budget hearings. This was really the time that we could fit it in. So I appreciate everyone's flexibility and consider this the uh, the exception, not the norm of, of when uh, at least I will be holding public hearings. But I thank everyone for taking the time to do so. Uh, today's meeting, we have internal and external stakeholders as well as um, input from public ci or from citizens of the city of Columbus uh, to talk about the current status of uh, the code enforcement law in the city of Columbus, uh, to talk about the code process, to talk about some of the changes that de development is proposing, some of the changes that uh, the Department of uh, Building and Zoning Services are, 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 uh, are doing in order to uh, make our properties, uh, rental properties in the city of Columbus, uh, uh, the best properties for tenants to be able to live and raise their family. Uh, I was asked earlier today, you know, why are we doing, you know, what's, what's the importance of, of uh, having, you know, solid landlords and good tenants renting properties in the city of Columbus. And I said that without two basic things, which is health and a dignified place to lay your head at night, really we're nothing as a society. And we ask so much of people uh, and people ask so much of us, but without those two basic building blocks, Really, how can you succeed in society? How can you get an education if you're if you're a child? How can you you know get up and go to work if you're an adult? Um, so this tackles one of those in discussing what the current status of some of the problems that we have in the city of Columbus regarding landlord tenant issues, landlord property or uh, some some deficient properties in the city of Columbus, uh, and what we can do uh, moving forward um, to address those issues. Council Member Mills, do you have anything to add? Yes, I did want to add um, in terms of the necessity of tonight's hearing that, again, as you mentioned, uh, the basic needs and the safety needs of our citizens have to be a priority. When we commit resources for the safety of our city, it goes beyond just police and fire. We have to look in terms of our entire infrastructure as a city that maintains safety for all of our citizens, and this is another step in that direction. Safety encompasses so much, and certainly um, having folks with a stable, appropriate, and adequate housing is, is absolutely a part of that. And again, as you mentioned, runs through the thread of, of how we see ourselves as a city. We are nothing with all the great buildings, and we can invest a lot, but uh, sewers and all that is just as important, but most important has to come to citizens and where they sleep and how they eat and making sure that all those things are happening is very important. So. Um, looking forward to hearing from all of the folks within uh, the city departments, particularly the city attorney's office and all of the folks in, in, in leadership there that are being um, asked to share their thoughts about this, but also asked to look and work towards solutions. And I also want to commend uh, Judge Hawkins for being present this evening. He's been on top of things uh, from day one in terms of showing the importance to this issue. So I want to thank him again for being here as he was present at the budget hearing. So I appreciate Judge Hawkins and, and being very, um, and react, not just reactive, but trying to get ahead of things. So I appreciate his attendance and that's all, Chairman Klein. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mills. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Councilmember Craig. Councilmember Craig, do you have any opening remarks or anything you'd like to say? Uh, let me uh, just, uh, really preface my remarks by thanking uh, uh, you, uh, Chairman uh, Klein and uh, uh, Chairman Mills for, uh, for opening up uh, this process uh, to the public. This is a, a vitally important issue. Uh, it's more than just us talking about it. Uh, I know the city attorney has been working with this issue uh, for many years. I know that your engagement has been long term as well as uh, Councilmember Mills. So I certainly am encouraged. Uh, I look forward to the public comments regarding this as we're looking for solutions.
to a very complex, uh, very, very serious issue uh, to move towards uh, uh, transition and solutions in this area. So thank you for allowing me to be here this evening. Okay, so we'll proceed directly into uh, the presentations and uh, testimony. Uh, the first person that's going to speak, the order is going to be uh, Department of Development and then Building and Zoning Services, then the City Attorney's Office, and then uh, uh, Judge Hawkins from the Environmental Court. Uh, so, Deputy Director Brandon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Klein, Chairman Mills, and Chairman uh, Craig. I'd like to thank you again for holding a hearing on this topic. It is very important to the Department of Development, as well as the residents of the City of Columbus. Uh, I am Nicole Brandon with the Department of Development, the Deputy Director, and although this subject is one that impacts the department as a whole, at this time I'm going to turn it over to our Division Administrator, Dana Rose, to speak to you specifically about our current process, as well as proposed changes to uh, help us further enforce these laws and hold property owners accountable. So I'm going to turn it over at this time to Dana Rose. Mr. Rose, the floor is yours. Appreciate the opportunity, uh, Council Member Klein, Council Member Craig, Council Member Mills to appear, also Attorney Pfeiffer to, to be here today and talk a little bit about the code process and, and how we're going to move forward. Uh, the process now, we receive over 20,000 complaints from the 311 call center, and we're basically a reactive uh, type group. Uh, it, we, it, takes us, it takes us a while to to run down all these 20,000 complaints, which means we're not very proactive. We are proactive in the neighborhood prides. We do get a little bit proactive with in the weeds in the summertime. And uh, if we go out to address a complaint, uh, if we see uh, violations adjacent to across the street, we're proactive in that way. But basically, uh, we spend most of our time uh, addressing these over 27,000 complaints per year. The normal process is we get a complaint from 311, it goes to our inspectors, we go out, we make the inspection, if there's a code violation, we issue a notice. Uh, notices can be anywhere from seven days to 10 days, 20 days for a zoning violation, 30 days for a housing violation. Uh, the, uh, the violator can appeal that, can ask for an extension. Uh, at the end of that time period, if that doesn't happen, then we have the option to uh, file either a criminal affidavit or a uh, civil affidavit and turn it over to Attorney Pfeiffer's office to, to uh, pursue that. Uh, that's the current process now. In 2014, uh, we've been fortunate enough to be able to add in the budget eight new code officers. That'd be seven code officers and one supervisor. And what we're thinking at this time is dividing those two teams into two different areas. One area would be uh, to look at the landlords, the landlords that own multiple properties uh, with a lot of violations. Uh, we want to look as many of those properties as we can. If they don't fix the violations, we want to get those into the civil or criminal court. That'd be one team. The other team would be another team working with some of the areas through the area commissions to uh, address any concerns they may have or any areas within their area commission that they feel would need some help. These two teams are going to be proactive in how they're going to be different than the normal inspector. They're not going to be, uh, they're not going to have any complaints coming from 311. They're going to be completely on their own, uh, addressing the landlords and or addressing uh, different areas within the city. Uh, it's going to take a while to get to all the areas, but uh, we're going to reach out to the area commissions after the first of the year and, and again, see what, uh, what, what concerns they have. So these, these two teams will be completely proactive which will be a uh, difference from what it is now. The uh, other thing we're working on is changing the, uh, the maximum penalties for not only the housing code, but the building code, the zoning code, health sanitation safety code from an M3 to an M1. The M3, the maximum penalty is 60 days and $500 fine. If we change it to an M1, it'll be 180 days, a $1,000 fine. That'll allow the environmental court and Judge Hawkins to uh, have a little more discretion as to, uh, you know, the penalties if needed for some of these landlords that don't comply with, with some of the violations. Briefly on technology, we do, right now, we have Galaxy Note 2 phones, which we have all the code officers uh, take with them. That allows them to take a picture, allows them to look at our Accela program in the field, 
and result inspections. What we want to do is go another step and uh, we're going to order uh, or get iPhone 5S phones, which will allow us to even be better with the Excel app, allow us to do more things in the field, result inspections, look at all our cases, and uh, it just makes us more efficient in the field. So we look to order those after the first of the year. Uh, last thing is, is the, uh, uh, the penalties uh, or the enhancements to the code that we may look at. Uh, I think right now the housing code and the building code, I think th those are okay. We're just kind of looking at uh, more of how we can make these inspections, how we can get orders to these people and get them into the environmental court or get them to Attorney Fiverr's office. There's always the issue of the LLCs, which everybody's aware of. Uh, I think Attorney Pfeiffer is working, or still working with some of the sheriff sale properties on the vacant properties where they can be sold at market value as opposed to two thirds of their appraised value. Maybe Attorney Pfeiffer want to talk to that a little bit. A little bit. Uh, but uh, we're looking and we're still taking any suggestions that anybody has as to help this process and, and help us speed it up. Mainly if we could have something where we could uh, be sure that we could inspect some of these rental properties where the landlords might object to us going in there. Uh, when we do take them to court, we have some leverage uh, to get in and inspect all their properties without a, if we don't get them into court, we may have some problems with the tenants not coming forward or the landlords balking on that. We're still looking at things we can change with the code that would help us to do that. I think that in summary is what we're, uh, we're trying to come up with. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Uh, just a couple questions. Sure. You know, I know you've been doing this for, for quite some time. Uh, do you feel in your experience that uh, this is an issue that, um, and this meaning um, really what we're describing as problem properties? Uh, is it really a few bad actors causing a vast majority of the problems that, you know, a few bad actors that own, you know, uh, numerous properties that are causing the problems? Because I, I recognize that there's a difference between, um, you know, someone who's falling on hard times and you know, simply having trouble keeping up with, with their property, and that's understandable, he will fall on hard times, mm -hmm. versus someone who ha who's habitually um, causing a significant amount of problem, who understands that they're in what was maybe some ways trying to game the system, that really don't care about the property or the people that are, that the tenants, they're just more interested in receiving income. So like, in your opinion, in your experience, like, how would you proportion the ratio if you can? Is, is, it, is it a couple bad actors? Is this more of a pervasive problem? How would you describe it? I, I think there's many there's many actors. Uh, it's just it's just not a few, and it, it covers both realms. Uh, I think what normally happens, people get multiple properties, say 20 or 30, be that an LLC or, or a, a private person. They just can't take care of it. They just you know they their their idea is to make a lot of money without putting a lot of money into the places. Mm -hmm. So they just get behind and they can't they can't they can take care of five properties, but they can't take care of 30. And that's what we're in the process of finding now, just how many people there are. But there are multiple, multiple, multiple owners with multiple properties that uh, it just gets too much for them. Mm -hmm. So what they really need to do is, is you know, downscale a little bit. And then uh, switching gears to what, what does code have in its arsenal to, um, outside of just, I, I guess, simply asking the tenant uh, of being able to explore inside the property, say for running water or for electricity or for heat, or, you know, how, how does that work and what's the code process for that? Well, yes, we have to have, you know, permission to go in a property. If the tenant obviously has control of the property, they let us in, we can get in. If the owner wants us in and the, t the tenant doesn't, well, then we can, the owner can give them notice and get in. If neither the tenant or the owner wants us in, then we have to have probable cause to, to make an inspection. And normally that takes somebody being in that property that is a, uh, a policeman, a paramedic, a social worker. Uh, normally the judge will not uh, you know, give us an administrative search warrant on a neighbor or a friend or something like that, but uh, with probable cause we can get in. Okay, Council Member Mills, you have any questions for Mr. Rose? I have a few questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Khan. I wanted to ask from a current standpoint, you mentioned 20,000 complaints on an annual basis. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Yeah. And so it, currently, not thinking through the two teams, from a ratio standpoint, do you have any sense of what that is from a manpower to complaint ratio? Uh, not, not right offhand. 
You mean the twenty over twenty thousand to the yeah. So yeah, you, we have forty five inspectors right now that answer the complaints. Okay. So that helps me divide that out. And is the the thought behind the two teams to improve that ratio to complaint? Because it sounds like the two teams have two different purposes. There will still be just one team adding to the current team to address the complaints and one that's not complaint driven? Both, both teams won't be complaint driven. They'll be, uh, the one will be looking at the landlord situation, the multiple landlords with uh, how, many properties, how many properties they own, how many violations percentage wise do they have and, and taking a, trying to take a look at those. They won't be involved in the complaints. The other team that will be involved in the areas uh, will will look at complaints to maybe to pick an area, but they're not going to be answering complaints. So that will free them up completely from, from the complaint process. Right. So the increased capacity for the complaints that are coming in are currently at a 20,000 number. There's maybe eight more m members that you'll add to that 45? It would be eight more members, but they won't be addressing any of the, the complaints. They'll be acting separately, independent of those. Okay, so how many will be answering the complaints? Forty-five. That will remain the same? Yes. You're, you're not, the two teams that you're proposing are not to assist your current capacity to address? Correct. But you've got to keep in mind that uh, we've just recently come up uh, in 2007 and 2008, we had 45 code officers. Uh, since then, it's gone down to around 37, 38. So we're back up to where we were at those levels. So it's going to help us tremendously answering those 20,000 complaints. The proposal will take you back to the 45. No, no. Or they, no, you're at 45 we're now. At 45 right Today. now. Today, you have 45. Right now, yeah. You're proposing adding two more teams, which gives you how many more to that 45 and the manpower? 45 would be eight, so you got 53. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. My other question um, I had, you mentioned um, some changes that for the non-complaint driven, and then there's some folks that are working with the area commissions. Can you distinguish to me what those two teams will add in terms of manpower and how that, I didn't quite understand how you were explaining the two different teams. One will work with the area commissions and I'm assuming that those are based on only area commission complaints. Mm -hmm. And then there's another no. team that's not. So if you could elaborate in more detail okay. and be more specific about it, because I didn't understand it the first time. So in your second run at it, if you could be a little more clear about it, I okay. appreciate it. The one team of the additional eight people we're working, uh, starting out strictly with landlords and occupied structures, and also there'll be some vacant structures also. Non-complaint driven, just looking at the landlords that own multiple properties, but trying to make inspections on those and uh, if there's non-compliance and getting those violators into court. That's the one team. The other team will be working in the different areas. We'll, we'll, we're going to go out to the area commission starting in January. They won't be complaint driven either, but we're work, working in different areas to see what, uh, what their issues are and uh, how we can help in the different areas. Uh, that won't be complaint driven either. This will be in addition to the inspectors that are already in that area. Okay. That's all for now. Okay. I think Councilmember Mills raise, raises an interesting point. And so the new eight officers um, will indirectly cut into the 20,000 complaints because they're going to be proactive, which will not lead to a complaint. They'll, they'll be proactive in assessing the violations. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So theoretically, if they're in an area, uh, say they're in the south side working in addition to the regular code officers there and they're doing their thing, then theoretically that should cut down on the number of complaints coming from that area. Instead of being complaint driven, those eight are going to focus proactively as they drive around and identify yes. code violations. Yes. Okay, Councilmember Craig, do you have anything, any questions for Mr. Rose? Not okay. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Thank you. Deputy Director Brandon, do you have any further commentary on behalf of the Department of Development? Not at this time. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. Our next speaker or presenter is Scott Messer. Where's Scott? Oh, there you are, Scott. How you doing, De or Director Messer? Um, floor's yours. 
Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Klein and uh, Chair Mills, Councilmember Craig. I appreciate the opportunity to um, talk today about this important issue of, um, that, that's been affecting us for some time. The, the um, Building and Zoning Department is uh, primarily focused on permits and inspections, but uh, uh, another part, another aspect of what we do that deals with the topic here today is we deal with vacant and abandoned housing from the standpoint that we issue orders when residences or multifamily units are deemed unsafe in accordance with the building code. So um, many of these properties may have code violations that, uh, housing code violations that do, don't necessarily have the property rise to the level of being unsafe to occupy. But if the violations are violations that make the property so unsafe, uh, the building code becomes also involved and we issue orders. So I wanted to highlight today uh, some of the efforts that the Building and Zoning Department has taken to address this specific area of unsafe properties. Um, we've taken several steps to focus additional resources on the problem, to streamline the processes and increase efficiencies in dealing with these situations. So this year we created a new compliance section where we added several new case managers whose sole responsibility is to manage only those um, properties that have been deemed unsafe. They manage the, they write the order, they issue the order, they follow up on everything from uh, uh, writing the order to uh, ultimate compliance. Uh, when that is not possible um, it, to bring properties into compliance, they also move into an enforcement situation. Um, we revamped all of our orders to communicate more clearly with property owners and, and really revamp the entire process. Um, what we found is also we've been able to use technology to our advantage. Uh, so uh, the same database system that code enforcement uses, we use as well, the Acela system. And essentially, it allows us access to repeat offenders, allows us access to track history of properties, allows us access to track exactly how many orders we've written, for what purpose we've written the order, and what the status of those orders are. Um, at the end of the day, compliance really tends to still be our, our significant emphasis. Um, sometimes the court system historically has been slow and, and difficult to achieve our goals. Uh, we've talked about problems such as LLCs that uh, make it difficult when you have an LLC to go through the court process and hold an individual responsible. So we've partnered um, with the city attorney's office and the environmental court and really uh, improved the court process as a tool. And also, uh, we've implemented some strategies outside of court uh, to deal with this problem when court is really not as effective. So, for example, we notify uh, lien holders whenever we issue a property and, may, and call it unsafe. We notify the mortgage company that may be involved or other lien holders. Uh, if we can find out who the insurance company is, we'll notify the insurance company that we've issued orders. And we are also looking at uh, recording some instruments with the recorder's office to notify potential um, buyers of those properties that there are outstanding violations. It's, it's been uh, very pleasant uh, to see the extra compliance that we've been able to gain when we have the pressure from some of these other parties on, on these owners to get into compliance. Some of those strategies have uh, been extremely successful. We've also become more aggressive when it comes to uh, demolitions. Uh, again, working with the city attorney's office, we've determined that the city code does allow for the building department in search certain situations to move ahead with demolitions of unsafe structures, even without extensive court action. As long as we've had due process and we've given owners an opportunity to comply and they've refused and the property remains hazardous and a nuisance, the building department in its own right can move forward with demolition. So we have moved a large chunk of properties that historically have been sitting uh, you know, sort of in the court process, difficult to get to where we need to be. We've just moved them straight over to move ahead with demolition process for those properties. Um, th there's currently uh, 150 properties that we monitor that, that the, the building department is saying is unsafe. So that gives you an idea of the scope of properties at any given time that we're generally looking at um, in terms of a number. Um, we, uh, we have also been able to partner with Development Department and the Land Bank through our VAP initiative. 
vacant abandoned properties. So we meet regularly and partner with those departments to identify the worst of the worst properties in the city. And, and we partner to say, is this something building should be taking the initiative on? Should development be moving forward? Is land bank moving forward? The city attorney partners with that. So we have regular meetings where we're looking at the worst of the worst of these properties and collaborate together to find what's the best creative solution uh, to deal with these situations. Um, I, I think this year has certainly been a year that we have seen a transformation from a building department standpoint um, in being able to deal with these situations. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Chair Klein, about bad actors. I just kind of wanted to address that from our department standpoint. What we have found is um, at any given time, it's not a volume issue where I have, you know, two certain landlords or property owners that have a large volume of orders. But what, what we do find is the same people, you know, time and time and time again. So uh, we do have a lot of situations where it may not be that out of my 150 properties, you know, 30 of them belong to two people. But if, if there's one person on there, that person tends to always be on the list. I take care of one property, they have another property. We take care of that property, they have a new property. And so um, we have began to use our case managers to, you know, look at all of those properties that belong to those landlords and, and take a more aggressive approach. Uh, the new criminal um, changes that we're looking at doing, changing the misdemeanor violations has been very helpful. Um, I certainly have been um, very pleased with the results we've been getting with the new court uh, process and the new judge. That's been very successful. So um, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be able to continue to make changes and improvements. And um, I, I just appreciate this hearing today. I think it's a great step to, to really get everyone talking about the problem. And um, again, we're always open to suggestions and improvements that we can make. Thank you, Director Messer. Uh, just a, a quick question about... Um, occupancy permits, do those exist in the residential area? And if so, how does that work? Yeah, um, essentially properties require you to have a certificate of occupancy to occupy the property. The certificate of occupancy is a result generally of a permit process. So if you're uh, remodeling a home or you're remodeling something, uh, at the end of that process you get a certificate of occupancy. Um, some, some properties are so, so old that they don't have a permit process that has resulted, so they just have an existing uh, understood certificate of occupancy. But in any case, those can always be revoked. And whenever we declare a property unsafe, we revoke the certificate of occupancy. The city code requires us to inform not only the occupant but the owner that the property is now unsafe to occupy and by code it should not be occupied. And by unsafe, are you in your department strictly talking about structural deficiency? There's there's a a, a specific um, code section. Structural deficiency is is one of the issues. It's, it could also be due to fire hazards, electrical hazards, other issues that make the property unsafe to occupy. So it's a it's a pretty general um, definition. But but uh, usually the, what we are talking about is something more unsafe from a structural standpoint or a mechanical standpoint. Okay, thank you, Director. Any questions for the Director, Councilmember Mills? Councilmember Mills. Thank you, Councilmember Clyde. I have a couple questions. So it's, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's two approaches that, from a collaboration standpoint, can be effective in working with the Department of Development and the other departments. By landlord or by property, it sounds like. It, that there's an opportunity where you're looking at an LLC that potentially owns several properties, and once you know all the properties that that group owns, you can address it and collaborate around that particular group of properties? Do I understand that correctly? That's correct. I mean, I think going into this year, I think one of the strategies that we've all been able to look at is to say we have these property owners who appear to be multiple offenders. And we need to begin to utilize strategies to uh, make sure that we're paying attention to all of their properties and assess their properties. The struggle is always not only with the building department but code enforcement. So there still are you know, some barriers of probable cause and entry rights and things like that to where it's not always just you know, start going around and knocking on doors and finding violations. We still need to have some 
you know, probable cause or reason why we investigate these properties. And so there are some challenges, you know, when we're targeting specific owners or properties, but um, we're being as aggressive as we possibly can. Okay, so when I look at this, like with liquor objections and looking at the bad actors and just figuring out when move from place to place, license, permit, moving around and all that sort of thing, you know by property, it, it, when a complaint or someone is giving you information on the address, you have some ability to look up and see if they're part of that group, that bad acting group. Absolutely. Okay. The other question I had was, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on when you say the LLC problem, and I think I got a grasp of it from what you were sharing, it's hard to kind of track, but is there any other challenges that you want to share that you can elaborate on when it comes to what potential problems LLCs present to you in terms of multiple property ownership? Well, I'll, I'll share a little bit from my perspective, but perhaps um, City Attorney Pfeiffer may be able to address that in more detail. But from, from my perspective, the difficulty has, is generally we're not able to get an individual that we were able to bring into court and actually hold accountable. So there's a, an umbrella corporation, an LLC that owns the property. And you know, fining or holding an LLC accountable is very difficult because it's not an actual individual. But again, you know, perhaps City Attorney Pfeiffer would be better to answer some of those challenges. Okay, and one other question for you, I'm sure the City Attorney's presentation will cover a lot of, a mm -hmm. lot of that. The notification to lien holders about a property being given unsafe standards, are there just any proactive conversation with lien holders that is an approach that maybe we could consider or that would have no bearing on helping the solution? Well, um, from a proactive standpoint, we have certainly, we have reached out to lien holders in terms of situations where properties are bank owned or in situations where we're getting no response from owners and no reaction whatsoever. If there is a bank who is involved or a lien holder, we have reached out to them to discuss some of our options with the, you know, demolition and making sure the properties are secured and, and finding ways to creatively make sure we make the properties as safe as they can. Um, we have also began to reach out to entities like um, title companies and uh, the Board of Realtors to talk about ways that we can get them involved to check up on these properties before they change ownership, find out do they have outstanding building orders, do they have outstanding code violations. Um, we're, we're trying to use the community at large to partner to deal with this issue, to say we all care about this. And so if we can get these other entities involved, it's really uh, made a tremendous difference and what we've seen in terms of compliance. That's all I have. Council Member Craig. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Klein. Uh, the segue to that question, uh, Director Messer, uh, what has been the nature of those conversations in terms of the recept receptivity, uh, in, in terms of the lien holders? What specific steps or have they been open to uh, uh, the conversations regarding uh, challenge properties. What, what specifically, what specific steps have they taken, the lien holders regarding this? Well, in, in terms of, uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Craig, uh, I, for that question. I think that they've been receptive to, to some extent. Um, we have not had, you know, really in-depth conversations maybe about what their strategies are to deal with, you know, their own issues or challenges, but certainly from the standpoint of partnering with us, to uh, find to deal with these properties, find ways to make sure that they're secured, find ways to talk about demolition and the options that we have for demolition. They they certainly have been receptive. I think uh, a couple of years earlier, I think a lot of these uh, uh, mortgage companies and banks were overwhelmed with the amount of um, foreclosures and other items that were that were going on, and they were it was difficult for us to get a lot of. Um, contact and conversations going, but recently, this year, we've had much more um, cooperation and much, much better luck at getting attention to, for us on our issues. So we're pleased. Okay. Uh, thank you, Director Messer. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Mills. Sorry, Councilmember McClain, I had another question. Um, Director Messer, my question in regards to uh, tracking by property, I, I was remiss in asking my other question. 
and when you said having access to history of properties in the system, you can query or search based on both the property address and the landlord? That's that correct. Using? Okay. Um, uh, the database that we use essentially has um, a, a search feature where you can search, you know, a variety of, of fields and, and things that you're looking for. So if I'm just looking for a certain type of order, I can search and it'll tell me all of those orders. If I'm looking for a certain address, I can just look at that address and everything that's ever been, you know, entered in the system on that address. Those are multiple ways that I can search. It's, it's a very robust database. So in the case of a, 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 a certificate of occupancy being revoked, a tenant who's looking at a property could find out if information on the property, if they contacted you before... Okay, That's correct. I just, I just want, okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Director Messer. Uh, the next is uh, the Honorable Richard C. Pfeiffer, the Columbus City Attorney. The floor is yours. Uh, Chair Klein, Chair Mills, and Chair uh, uh, Craig, uh, thank you for having us here. We have several people who will present on our behalf. I'd like just to make a general comment. You're the legislative body. You're the ones that put on the books what the laws are. So now you have to consider whether the laws that we have are adequate or whether we need new laws. And that's going to be a function that you decide. I'd like to spend a few moments just talking about the fact that there are laws that already exist in this area. The laws that exist in this area are to be administered by the executive branch of government. And then when we think it should go to court, we take it to the judicial branch. That's a common, that's a basic civic lesson. But first of all, the Ohio General Assembly has enacted some laws. And the Landlord-Tenant Act of some time ago let me just recite to you that there, are, there is in the Ohio Revised Code, section 532104, that speaks to landlord obligations. Likewise, there's another section that, re, that, that re, is regards to tenant obligations. Landlord's obligation, let me just read part of it, comply with the requirements of all applicable building, housing, health, and safety codes that materially affect health and safety. That's basic, and you're supposed to make sure the property's updated. The tenants also have obligations. Among them is to use the property without wasting it, not destroying it. And here, here is some things that are going to come into play because I know there's some concern about tenant behavior in rental property. We always talk about landlords. Good landlords, bad landlords. Do we talk about tenants? Good tenants, quote, bad tenants. But the obligation under the revised code for tenants are several. They have to comply with the requirements imposed on tenants relative to the state housing health codes. And listen to this. Conduct himself and require other persons on the premises with his consent to conduct themselves in a manner that will not disturb his neighbor's peaceful enjoyment of the premises. Conduct himself and require persons, and it's all in the masculine gender, so just to go with more on this, his household and persons on the premises with his consent to conduct themselves in connection with the premises so as not to violate the prohibitions contained in chapter 2925, that's drug offenses, or chapter 3719, that's controlled substances, or in municipal ordinances that are substantially similar. In other words, tenants have responsibility when they use the property. Now, we have a little slideshow here. We start off with a picture and a title, but let's flip it over and show you who in our office does the work. And I'm not sure who's flipping the thing for me, Mark, thanks. You should all be aware of our zone initiative. The Columbus Division of Police has divided Columbus into five zones. There is an attorney assigned to each zone, and that attorney's responsibility is to go to all the police roll calls at least once so that he or she knows the police, the, the area. Go to area commission meetings and civic associations and work with code officers, building and zoning services, health department, and fire officials. So you see the pictures of folks. We have Bill Spralaza, Jaisa Page, Kristen Crawfletch, Steve Dunbar, and I'm also mentioning there are two attorneys that aren't part of the zone, but are principally responsible for the prosecution of the criminal offenses in Judge Hawkins' courts. And those are Shonda Martin and Jared Skinner. Now, if we flip it, let me just show you some of the laws. I just already cited. Well, what's a public nuisance? Very basic. So let me read it. An act, condition, or thing that is illegal because it interferes with the rights of the public generally. Now, we all know in America... The right to private property is a very strong right. But we also know that commensurate with that right are responsibilities. So we are basically dealing in our effort to make sure that while we observe the right, 
We make sure the responsibilities of ownership are maintained, and that's why you have uh, the development department, building and sewing services, and that's why we have the courts to try to get people to meet up with their responsibilities. So we define public nuisance in the Columbus City Code, and if anybody wants to refer to it, please do, and it basically says that any property that is not in compliance with the housing, building, zoning, fire, or safety ordinance is by statute a statutory public nuisance. So if we can prove to the court that we have a property that's in violation of our local ordinances in that regard, we have a finding of violation. Now, if you flip the page, we also provide in the Ohio Revised Code, and we use this a lot, chapter 3767, public nuisances. And we use that a lot because what we try to do is take cases to court civilly. And again, it's if there's a violation of the housing code, building or safety, or if there's drug offenses or prostitution going on, we go after the property's use and try to abate the nuisance. Now, well, I'm going to hold on the Cincinnati ordinance because there's a lot of discussion that's occurred lately. I know the local newspapers talked about it. What are we doing about the tenants that cause problems to disturb the peace and quiet of the neighborhood? Uh, before we go there, however, I want to first refer, and he doesn't know his, he's up next, but I want to talk, ask Bill Spralazza to talk about what he does in abating nuisances. Now, our goal is, if there is a nuisance, our goal is to abate the nuisance, get the property in compliance. Bill, will you carry on about what you do and how you interact with the various agencies you deal with? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, uh, City Attorney <coughs> Pfeiffer, members of council. Um, we use uh, these two sections, 3767 and uh, 4703, uh, in, in an effort uh, for the city to file uh, a civil case against uh, a nuisance property and the, the bad actors at that property and the owners of that property. What types of people do we file against would be the first consideration. Well, there's an array of people. First, certainly the owner of the property. Uh, secondly, uh, anybody occupying the property or living at the property. Third, anybody who is conducting a nuisance activity at the property. And finally, also uh, the property itself, uh, the, the building and the land. Uh, secondly, what types of nuisance activities do we, uh, do we use as part of our civil case? Uh, typically, felony drug activity uh, tends to be a big one. Uh, prostitution and lewdness. And if you, you see in the slide there that uh, uh, 3767, the one before, uh, uh, 376701 C1 defines nuisance first as that which is defined and declared by statute to be a nuisance. Uh, 3719 declares that uh, felony violations of the drug and controlled substance uh, codes are a nuisance. So we use that often. And Bill, if you could, could you talk specifically about how you go at the permit holders too in terms of eliminating those nuisance activities? Yeah, liquor permits? Yes, yes. sir. Uh, secondly, again, uh, to finish here, prostitution, lewdness, things of that nature. Uh, the third point, uh, alcohol uh, issues. Uh, permit holders uh, certainly can uh, be the subject of a nuisance abatement uh, if they are involved in an underage sale of alcohol. Um, also, we use uh, the uh, keeper of a place code for places that do not have permits but are selling alcohol nonetheless. Uh, each of those have been statutorily defined as a nuisance, so we would file a, a nuisance abatement okay. in those regards as well. Um, okay, if you could just hold up, that's good mm -hmm. enough, thanks. Yep. Now I want to switch now to Shonda Martin and Jared Skinner, because you can, we can approach the enforcement of these ordinances either by a criminal complaint, which is a third degree misdemeanor, or we can file a civil action for injunctive relief. If we choose to go with a criminal complaint, the attorneys in our office that handle that would be Shonda Martin and Jared Skinner, so I'd ask either or both of you to comment about how you deal with those issues. Um, thank you, uh, Councilman Klein, Craig, as well, Councilwoman Mills. Um, both Shonda and I, we both, our, our goal is to abate the nuisance, as that city attorney said. One, like I said, to abate the nuisance, and then the second thing is to hold repeat offenders accountable as far as keeping them on probation to make sure they do not have to come, come back with the same offense without no penalties. I know on Fridays, myself, Shonda, as well as Jiza and uh, Kristen, we all meet at Code, and what we do while we're there on Friday is we evaluate the cases that may be filed criminally. Uh, there have been situations where we look at a particular case, and what we do is we look at to see whether or not we can abate the nuisance in the criminal realm or the civil realm, and that kind of depends on the property and the issues that are presented. Um, 
there have been times where we look at a particular case and we determine within our criminal structure, we may not be able to abate the nuisance. So at that point in time, we would probably refer the case for civil action or to see whether or not land bank or the VAT program would be, probably be the best. Um, if we do sign off on a complaint, as far as our process in court, we do, um, we have a liaison from both office, the building and zoning who helps us get the background of all of our defendants. Um, typically, once we have a case, the case is not closed until the property is in compliance. Um, even if, if a person pleads guilty to the offense, we set it off for sentencing, we give that person an opportunity to come back yeah. and fix the problem, and if they don't fix the problem, depending on the circumstances, we would either ask for jail or we were asked for, or we give that person maybe a little more time to fix the problem. Um, with our liaisons in our offices, what we have is a good background of these repeat offenders. And from there, we typically ask for these people to be on probation um, for probably two to three years, maybe five, depending on who that particular person is. And um, we've had situations where we were, able, we were very successful with jail as the deterrent. I can think of a property that was on Meeks Avenue where there was a probation violation and by agreement, the defendant was either to have those property raised or go to jail on a set date. And the property were finally raised after long uh, bouts with uh, getting him to do what we asked him to do. We had situations where uh, we were able to get a person behind bars. We negotiated. Um, if they get out of jail, they need to present us with a a clear plan as to what they're going to do to fix the properties. And in a recent situation, we one particular person we let out of jail, and one of our goals was to go and look at all the properties he owns. Um, because we, I don't think we realized, well, I don't say we didn't realize, but I think we wanted to make sure that mm. all his properties were in compliance, both inside and outside. And I know you heard testimony about the probable cause aspects as to whether or not we can get into the properties. Um, because this person was on probation, a term of probation was for him to let us in the property to see how it looks inside and outside. Jared, just, Sean, do you got anything to add to all that? Um, uh, thank you, City Attorney. I just wanted to point out in council members that probably our biggest problem right now is the LLCs for criminal standpoints. Um, for individual owners, we always do have the option, hey, you come to court or we'll put a warrant out for your arrest and you will go to jail. LLCs, we do not have that option. We can't set a warrant out for an LLC. What they virtually do, they do not come to court, and then our hands are tied. Civilly, I know they have a different process, so they go through that in, in a different way, and they'll probably address the issue. But um, the LLCs and also the probation, and I want to address what Dana Rose said about the raising the penalties higher, making them um, misdemeanors in the first degree opposed in the third degrees, because probation is so effective. We can get them to agree to do things on probation that we can't ask legally for we can't at, criminally file charges against, like, hey, let us get see those properties. We can't make them do that, but hey, on probation, we can make you do that. If you agree to that, because you don't want to go to jail. Um, and when you have higher penalties, we have more jail time to hang over their head, so we can say, hey, 180 days in jail, okay, you have a revocation <coughs> hearing, the judge may revoke you for 90 days, and we're gonna still keep you on probation for five years for another 90 days. So that's a really powerful tool for us criminally, but LLCs are probably our right. biggest problem. And, and that is critical. If you, if you listen, and I'm sure you did, to Shonda and Jared, they spoke of people, individuals, who we brought with criminal charges. Because we have a coercive power. We can, we can hurt them. We can, put them. we can deprive them of their liberty. But you can't deprive an LLC of its liberty because what liberty does it have except to walk away from its problems? So mostly you'll see, practically only you'll see, individuals being charged criminally. Now, I want to focus with the Jiza Page and, and Kristen Crawfish. Perhaps if you could go to the podium. Could you please explain what you do in terms of the civil action, the time it takes, and the difficulties we have, particularly in how you get somebody in court so that Judge Hawkins has jurisdiction to hear the case? Afternoon, council members. Um, I don't know exactly where we would want to start, but being on the subject of limited liability companies, um, that is definitely one of the biggest struggles that we also have, even with a civil litigation case. Um, reason being is, first off, you have to have your constitutional due process and service to even hail somebody into court. So even if I can't put an LLC in jail or put an individual in jail, 
um, I still need somebody who I can work with to find a private remedy. Um, this is going to be why a lot of these cases are falling on the city and, and so many individuals are requesting that the city you know, do something about this overwhelming problem that we have is we can't find private individuals um, who are guys by the, you know, the, this, this cape of an LLC that maybe in this situation shouldn't apply. Um, and I know with LLCs, a lot of people think of limited liability companies doing business, but this is literally a situation where we're lacking a law um, to, to determine when something is more a property that's simply put in the name of an LLC. There's no contractual business being undertaken. I know in the Ohio Revised Code, there's a very limited slice of law with Chapter 53 that talks about non-resident aliens um, who have some type of ownership and or interest in an LLC, and it makes them then lay out everything, shareholders, monies, various things that aren't required right now. Um, so even if we could hold an LLC liable, um, another obstacle that we would have is who are the individuals behind the LLC. Right now, all that needs to be filed with the Secretary of State as a statutory agent who can always resign afterward, quash service, and simply deny having anything to do with it. So if we don't have a way to know who those shareholders are, for instance, you know, a, a property registered in two or more LLCs run by the same individuals must list every single shareholder. Some way to be able to find out who is behind it, um, it makes it incredibly difficult and it makes the amount of detective work versus enforcing policy and remedy. Um, Here's the problem, the basic, with the LLC. If we're going to get him to court, we have to notify them that we filed an action against them. And so how do you notify them? Well, supposedly LLCs are supposed to have on file with the Secretary of State a statutory agent. Can you explain the problems we've run already with supposedly current, statu uh, current uh, statutory agents on LLCs? Uh, statutory agents who may be on file. Um, if you go to the Secretary of State's website, it may still say that the LLC is active. However, when you go to attain service on the statutory agent who is listed on that page, um, the house has been foreclosed on. They simply refuse service. Uh, they deny that they are the statutory agent anymore. Half the time, they don't even do a formal filing that they've resigned as the statutory agent. Okay. And there's nothing you can do right, because thanks. you can't hold the statutory right. agent liable. They're supposed to communicate right. that to who should be. Thanks, Kristen. Jaisa, do you want to say anything about Motel 1 and what we're trying to do there and other kinds of things we try to do? Thank you. City Attorney Pfeiffer, Councilman Klein, Councilman Craig, and Councilman Mills. Um, another thing that we do using the civil process is basically we filed a verified complaint for injunctive relief. And what we are asking the court is for an injunction, a permanent injunction, in joining the owner, basically stopping them from maintaining a nuisance at the location. Specifically with Motel 1, which is on the east side of the city, we filed a verified complaint for injunctive relief and asked the court to enjoin the property owner from allowing any drugs and prostitution to happen at the property, as well as any code enforcement and building violations. And the court did give us an order um, on behalf, in favor of the city, enjoining the property owner from doing such things. And what that does is it gives us as a city the ability to come back against that property owner at any time once the nuisance happens again and we can motion for contempt based on that order. So those are one of the tools that we already have in place that does help and we can constantly hang something over the property owner's head when we do have that permanent injunction, which is of course different from the criminal process where they have court jail time or probation. And here's the thing that we also try to figure out. Every Friday, Jiza Page, Kristen Crawfletch, Jared Skinner, and Shonda Martin go out to code up on Carolyn Avenue and sit with code officers and look at each code officer's case and try to determine based on the facts the code officer is presenting what is the better or best way to proceed against these properties. Frankly, in some cases, we look at it in the end and we say to the code officer, we're not sure we're going to be able to bait these nuis this nuisance at all which is not what the code officer wants to have. Understand the pressure a code officer is under. He or she's out in the community on a regular basis. Neighbors are complaining. What are you doing? What are you doing? And so the code officer's job is to identify the nature of the violations and then give the case to us. And a lot of times we'll hear, well, it's over in the city attorney's office. Uh, and frankly, in some cases, if the LLC is bankrupt, we can't, we can't abate this nuisance unless the city, unless it's tax delinquent, and the city wants it in its land bank and then takes it to a tax foreclosure. But once the city has the property, what's the city going to do with it? John Turner is ahead of our land bank, does an excellent job. And in many cases, 
he will, he will take a property if he can figure out how to get rid of it to an owner. But there are some properties out there. We have a, a, an example. We have a property out on Main Street by the railroad tracks, these huge silos. I'm sure you've probably seen it about in the paper. Well, the, the, is that a nuisance or not? Well, we were able to get the property properly fenced off, but think of that silo, those silos. What economic value do they have? And if they're going to be demolished, who's gonna pay for it and how costly that's gonna be? So those are issues we always face. So if you folks could sit down, I want to refer to, thank you. I want to go to the Cincinnati ordinance, and I want Steve Dunbar to talk about that. And I'm sure if there's questions afterwards, please ask them of all of us. This Cincinnati ordinance goes to this issue really of tenants who are causing problems, misconduct, and what then is the obligation of the landlord to do something about the tenant's behavior. Mr. Dunbar. Oh, and also say Steve's over at our police legal, so he deals with the police on a lot of these issues. Steve. Thank you all. Uh, as you see up on the PowerPoint right now, we have a, a hunk of Cincinnati's, what they call their chronic nuisance code. Um, basically what they've said is here's a dozen-ish offenses that, that we deem to be nuisance offenses. Everything from an assault to disorderly conduct, loud music, uh, drug activity, prostitution, gambling. Um, what Cincinnati does is instead of going through a judicial process, as we often do here by filing a lawsuit or filing a criminal action, they do this almost completely in-house administratively. What they do is uh, generate reports. This is a collaboration between their police and their city solicitor's office. They generate monthly reports to determine what types of police runs have been at each property in the city. And if these sorts of offenses show up, uh, it, it gets on their radar as a potential chronic nuisance property. Uh, the, the lowest threshold is three violations a month. When that happens, they send a notice out to the property owner saying, hey, looks like you're a nuisance property. You need to do something about it in pretty short order. Um, that property owner is then required to provide some sort of plan, an action plan to remedy the nuisance uh, activity on their property. The city solicitor keeps monitoring those properties and going forward if those sorts of runs keep happening. And when I say runs, it's not just police respond to a call of a disorderly conduct. To get to this point, they have to have probable cause to believe that offense actually occurred. So it's not just how many random unsubstantiated calls did we get, but how many times do we believe these offenses actually occurred on your property? If that happens, they begin to assess the real property owner for the cost of those response. Basically, you've had the number of uh, offenses on your property. We, every month now, are going to send you a bill. And that bill is going to say, this month we had three, four, five runs for these sorts of nuisance activities. Uh, they charge them $100 a pop. Basically, they, they've run their numbers and said that's our average response cost for police, personnel, whatever the case may be. Uh, and, and they assess that as, as a cost to that property. Uh, and that accumulates. They can bring civil actions through collections to enforce it. Uh, they can do a number of other things. That's the law as it's on the books down there. And, and so you look at how, how does it actually work. I will tell you, in talking to the folks in Cincinnati, that monthly report pops up somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 properties a month. Uh, so they just look at their top 50 on that list. Uh, that top 50 is generally the same places with a little bit of fluctuation. It's generally very large multi-unit uh, rental uh, properties, um, and, and they assess those. Uh, as far as effectiveness or, or what would happen, it's always important to remember whenever we're talking about infringing on someone's property right, we're the government. The Constitution says government, you can't do too much stuff to people unless you've got a good reason. You have to have uh, a, a, basically an appeals process. So everything that I said leading up to now and then especially going forward with the fines, any of these folks can say, hey, I'm not subject to your fines, either bad information or I'm doing what I can. They have an administrative process in-house. It used to be with their police department, got moved from there to what they call their administrative hearing body. Um, basically, 
something as you think of akin to our BZA where you, you would go to hear an appeal. If they don't like the results there, they can always take them to common pleas court. Anytime you don't like what a city does administratively, you can do that. So that is, that is fundamentally this, this other option that Cincinnati has, has chosen to take to address the behavior of people at property. Doesn't help us with the, the structural violations uh, or the code or building violations that we talk about also. Uh, could you give some indication of the problems that Cincinnati ran into when it first uh, tried to implement this law? Sure. They got sued and had to pay a hundred grand. Um, basically because they are, they are pushing the envelope of, of what the government can do you know, without a full-blown judicial process, one of their large property owners sued them uh, for a, a number of reasons. But essentially what came of that, they had to pay a monetary settlement. They also made some significant changes to their code. Uh, these are changes that just passed in the last couple weeks, I believe, down there. We've got everything in-house. We've looked at it. What it what's good for us is at least it gives us a little bit of guidance of where that edge is. They, they potentially you know, pushed it to, to the line or, or across a bit, so they've made some tweaks to rein it in. That resolved in a settlement, no court finding down there. Uh, so it gives us a little bit of guidance. I would tell you the overriding thing that always has to happen is that due process. It ain't as easy as just your name popped up, here's your $1,000 bill. Uh, we end up with processes similar to what we've been talking about here that ultimately would end up with a judicial action if necessary. Uh, that's our presentation. If you have any questions, any of us will try to answer them. Thank you, uh, City Attorney. I have a couple questions. If it's okay, I'll just direct them to you and let you distribute them among your staff as you see fit or answer them yourself. Um, I guess we'll work backwards as far as my question is concerned. We'll start with Cincinnati ordinance since that was last talked about. Um, do the landlords initially get uh, uh, notice of police runs? Because one thing that concerns me is, you know, how would, a, how would a landlord ever know that there's a problem at his or her property, um, you know, unless maybe they live next door to the property, without receiving due notice from the police that there was, there was something going on there? Sure. They get the notice from their city solicitor's office. That first letter does not have a bill attached. So the first letter goes to the landlord, says, hey, the police say they had six of these nuisance activity runs. You need to do something about it. That's when you have this period, generally about 30 days, where they give the landowner time to submit an action plan. And then it's only after you get that first notice, you get 30 days or so, then if it keeps continuing, they start sending the bills. But they don't get six notices from the police department. It's just the, from the city solicitor of the aggregate on, a, say, a monthly basis. Correct. And, uh, and we don't have anything like that in the city of Columbus, right? There's no sort of notice that goes to a, a landlord that there's a run at his or her property? What we do as a part of some of the actions that, that our folks talked about, if we have drug activity at a property, a lot of times at CPD's narcotics folks, they'll send a certified letter to the landlord. Hey, please be advised. We have reason to believe there's drug activity at your property. Do something about it or we're going to sue you. Um, the fundamental difference between what Cincinnati does and what we do, a couple. Um, one, they do much more in-house administratively. Two, they do it more on, on um, kind of a, a reactor, reactive aggregate. Here's what the numbers show. What we do, and I think we do very well and, and probably better than they do in a lot of places, is if we have the high end, the drug activity, the gangs, the gambling, CPD investigates that. We'll send notice out when, when it's appropriate and you know, doesn't put anyone in, in harm's way um, about that significant criminal activity. What we do not have right now is a mechanism where we're sending notice to a landlord, hey, you had two noise violations and a couple disorderly conducts last month. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I will tell you that I have some concerns about how the Cincinnati ordinance operates in terms of due process. It seems like all we are trying to do in our, our motivation is to try to speed this up, to try to get this thing resolved. If you run too fast, you run over people's rights. And so that's why due process slows this process up. Um, we, we right now, and I'll share this, uh, our photo red light ordinance is being challenged in court. Uh, saying that, well, number one, we don't have the right to assign jurisdiction to the municipal court to hear these things. And I will tell you that if we lose that, it's going to be a big number. So you have to be careful about rushing to hear the newest new thing that's going to solve these problems. 
and uh, talking about the Ohio Revised Code, I don't know, Mark, do you have the, if you could pull up the nuisance definition within the ORC? And why he's doing that, uh, city attorney. Um, I noticed on the Cincinnati ordinance, and I'm not going to ask you to toggle back and forth, but um, uh, there were several things that appeared on the Ohio Revised Code ordinance that was wrapped into the Cincinnati ordinance. So could you talk about the overlap of some of the things that exist and maybe where Cincinnati took it a step further? Uh, in addition to that, the second part of the question is, um, what what's the mechanism... I, I, guess what, I guess what I'm asking is, could the city of Columbus add to expand its definition of what it would consider a nu nuisance. So we have like the Ohio Revised Code nuisance, and then we're looking at Columbus, you explored Cincinnati. There were some overlaps, obviously, driven by the Ohio Revised Code. Uh, Cincinnati added some other things to it. Like how does, is that, is that uh, you're suggesting city attorney, that's a policy-driven question from the city council. Uh, and, and once you add that as a, once you add something to that list, say the police runs or disorderly conduct or the loud noise, um, is that then a tool in your attorney's arsenals to uh, be able to uh, abate the nuisance? And I have a really long-winded question. If you want me is, to repeat it, I'd be all, happy to do so. It's a policy issue for you. City Council has to decide, yes, you can, you may expand the definition of a nuisance. The question becomes is, once expanded, how then do we establish the necessary proof giving rights to the defendant in due process to, to accomplish anything. Uh, my, my view is that expanding the definition is not the problem. In my view, the tricky part is how you enforce it. And I have a little difficulty in feeling comfortable about how Cincinnati is doing it. Uh, but I think we could probably do it by doing our normal process. If it's an individual, we could file a criminal complaint. But understand, then we have a burden. Burden beyond a reasonable doubt to prove the crime's been committed. Or if we go civilly, then our burden's clear and convincing. So we could do it, but it's not going to be a rapid thing to get accomplished. Okay. Uh, and then going to the LLC issue. Um, do you find that a majority of the properties that are owned by LLCs, are they, are they occupied or are they vacant properties? The second question is, are they generally up to taxes? I'll at, on, on their taxes. Mr. Chairman, I'll ask uh, either Ms. Page or Ms. Crawfish to answer that based on their daily experience with the LLCs as to whether or not their properties are occupied or vacant. Jai, you want to take a hit at that? Thank you. In our experience with the civil complaints, we find that most of the properties owned by LLCs are currently vacant at this time. Okay. Because it would seem to me that if they're occupied and they're paying rent to someone, and someone's collecting the rent, and that would certainly be at least uh, there could be an argument made that person who's collecting rent is an agent of that property, and then that, therefore service could be made. But if they're vacant, obviously no one is there to collect if, the rent. So I'm just trying to gra grasp. Mr. That. Chairman, if we have an LLC that has an occupied property, and we are able to identify an individual who's been responsible to collect the rents, to make calls for repairs, then we're going to go after that individual. And, and what about on the vacant, so the vacant properties owned by an LLC, what's generally their tax status? Are, there, are many of them not up to date with taxes? I'm seeing a thumbs the, down. The uh, indication is that they're delinquent in their taxes. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Councilmember Mills. Thank you, Chairman Kai. Uh, City Attorney, I just have a couple questions, and if you could. I think one of the questions is probably more for Director Messer than there is than uh, for your team. I'm just trying to get a grasp from the, the scope of everything, the percentage of the, the um, number of properties or landlords that are LLC owned and those that are presenting the greater challenges in terms of, of abating the nuisance that we have. The scope of that, is, is there any number or graphs that we can look at that doesn't allow us to use the tools that we have that requires us or suggests that we should make increased changes to the code so that there creates a greater tool to use. As I understand your question, I believe that most of our problem properties are with the LLCs. And I don't know that this council can enact any ordinance that would help us with that. I think what we have to look at is the Ohio General Assembly with some kind of statutory change that says if an LLC does not have a current 
statutory agent, in other words, someone you can serve and get into court, we need to do something draconian. But, but again, you're talking about taking away someone's property, even though it's an artificial entity. Okay, thank you. My next question is when, uh, when we're talking about what has actually occurred on the property, the ability to try and prove what has actually occurred on a property. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because that seems to be sort of a hinge pin as I look at liquor objections being our same issue and trying to determine legally sufficient evidence and they seem to be similar. So if you could elaborate on, on that and where that creates some of the challenges. Yes, generally speaking, the burden we have is probable cause to believe something happened. Um, that's the same standard that we police need to arrest someone. It's roughly the same standard that we call it something else to prove a civil case against someone. Um, and so we look at it, if police make an arrest, that generally gives us proof to the level of probable cause that something happened on that property. Now that person may be acquitted in a criminal setting because the standard's so much higher, but it's there. More often than not, it isn't that clean for us that we have an arrest, we have a conviction, and we can just give a certified copy of here's exactly what happened, so say the courts. That's when you end up with a lot of work. I mean, especially we talk about accumulating public nuisances, do we have to show five noise violations, three disorderly conducts, and two assaults happened and, and prove all of those? Um, ultimately, we do. Whenever we're talking about finding people, taking action against them and their properties, we're the government. It's on us to prove that it happened. Um, the, the liquor objections are, are a very good comparison in, in that manner. Those folks have the right to go to the different administrative bodies and say, no, it didn't happen, and not just that, you know, government, you've got to prove it. Um, it's what we work with every day, and it's what makes it sometimes difficult for the community members to say, hey, it happened, I saw it, or I heard about it. Um, when it's us and we're talking about it happened, so we're taking some you, something from you, it's obviously a more difficult burden. Chair Mills, by, by way of comparison, you, you just had a hearing or, or last night with Bill Sperlaza. I believe we have 2,000 liquor permit holders in the city of Columbus. I believe in the course of the public hearings you had asking the citizens to what are the problem properties? I believe you looked at about 100. We concluded that there were only 14 that had sufficient evidence that we could go after. So what do you suppose the citizens who brought in those 96 thought? We're not doing our job? No, it's very, you say, no, no, we believe what you say, but we can't prove it yet. But for 14 of them, we've got the evidence. And again, when the government moves on somebody, the government's pretty powerful. So you have to use that power. You, you can't run over individuals. Thank you, City Attorney. That's exactly why I'm, I'm trying to get a grasp of where, where we find that between that 150 and that 14, you know, it, and is that number of trouble that we have bigger because that gap that's there or LLC owned? And just trying to figure out from looking at the this entire issue, the bigger bang in terms of changes and, and the penalty proposed changes that we've been discussing what number can that really address when we have this, this other piece here because we still have the issue of did it actually occur to property kind of things when these nuisances happen and looking at the cincinnati code there's a section f that talks about attendance at school i've got to imagine that that one seems to be so vague and who you know does the child really live there is the custodian attendant all of that that probably would come into trying to actually prove that particular part of that code. So I'm, I'm just trying to, from a universe standpoint, get the sense of where we are and what the trouble is. Because again, comparing it to liquor objections, and yes, looking at 2,000, the shrink at 2,000, 150, sending NAG back out, going underage buys in between that time, what's happened in a year, what happened last year that built the case, and then said, now we go for objection. That's sort of in just trying to line those up into what we're discussing tonight, and what are those tools that help drive that? Uh, Chair Mills, the, the basic tool we need is good investigative work. We can't, the city attorney can't do the investigation. We are the, we are the prosecutors. It's the administrative branch of government. That's why it's so important that there are going to be eight new code officers in development. The quality of what we can bring to the court depends upon what the investigators have brought to us. What does the police investigation look like? What do code enforcement investigations look like? What's building and zoning services got? So the real, the real nuts and bolts, meat and potatoes, is that investigative work done by the executive branch of government to get us the facts necessary to succeed in court.
Thank, that's all I have right now, Chairman Klein. Okay, thank you, uh, City Attorney and uh, City Attorney staff for your information uh, that you provided. Uh, the next speaker, and thanks for your patience, uh, is the Honorable uh, Dan Hawkins, the Environmental Court Judge, Your Honor. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. <clears throat> um, thank you, Councilman Klein um, and Councilwoman um, Mills for having me here today. Um, I want to also um, take a moment to thank uh, City Attorney Rick Pfeiffer and his staff, as well as uh, the folks from Code Enforcement and the Development Department um, um, for making my transition um, onto the bench um, as uh, smoothly as, as could be expected considering the circumstances in which um, I took over the court. It is a very unique court. I think um, our city and our county is very lucky to have this court. There's nothing else like it in the entire state. I know Cleveland and Toledo have similar courts, but I think we really have a, a, a great court and a great tool here to help, um, um, help deal with some of these unique issues in our county, in our city. Um, to have um, not only one judge hearing these specific cases, but um, prosecutors, attorneys who um, are uniquely trained to deal with these specific issues, um, I, I think it, it really helps. So um, as be, has been uh, indicated earlier, it is a court of compliance. Um, I, I'm a, I have a background as a prosecutor, and in you know, in normal courtroom, you have uh, someone uh, tried and convicted, and then you send them to prison. Here in the environmental court, uh, typically the, the crime, if you will, the problem is still ongoing. So it is a court of compliance, and the goal, obviously, as stated earlier, is we want to make sure by the time the case is over, um, the problem is solved, the nuisance is abated. And that is my goal. I know that's uh, the attorney's goal, uh, both defense attorneys, um, homeowners, and the city attorney's um, goal in all of these cases. And um, as also been stated earlier, and as far as the criminal cases go, um, obviously, as with any criminal matter, you want to determine whether or not this is a first-time offender, somebody who just got in over their head, needs help. Um, our courts, um, with the help of our environmental specialist and the services are out there, we try to help those people in help fixing their properties and finding, hooking them up with particular resources to help them. Differentiating between those folks and the repeat offenders, if you will, uh, those folks who need increased fines or, or the jail time, jail time hanging over their head in order to get them in compliance. I would say that um, we're still pulling together data, although a, a cursory review of our information shows that about half, 50% uh, of the court's docket over the past two or three years um, are these housing code cases. Uh, the other cases we handle would be um, animal cases, uh, you know, dog license cases, animal cruelty cases, environmental crimes, both felony and misdemeanor crimes, those make up the, the remaining docket of the court. Um, it is, um, it, it's a very busy court, um, but like I said, I think we've got uh, great staff in there working uh, every day. Um, dealing with those offenders, um, the repeat offenders, if you will, um, is unique in that I, I believe the, the the strategy I, I've, I've utilized since taking over that court, um, I, I believe previously the, the strategy was to, again, wanting to make sure that the, the nuisance is abated, the problem is solved. I think previously the uh, prior court has granted several continuances or delays in order to get the problem fixed. Um, I always felt that that was more pulling the cart before the horse. Um, I, I think you need to, um, as Mr. Skinner noted earlier, I found that um, we found that having litigated the issue first, putting him on probation and hanging significant fines or jail time over their heads really gets the problem, um, the, the nuisance abated much more quicker than granting them continuance after continuance. Um, just a couple weeks ago, we had an individual um, in our court who had uh, several uh, disabled vehicles on his property. They had been there for over a year. Um, he came in the court wanting one more continuance, uh, super duper promise he'll have him, um, um, you know, off his property if he if he had gave him more time. And I gave him more time. I, I told the individual, you're going to jail in 10 days unless it's unless it's done. Here's your report date. You're to report to jail on this date unless you show proof that that stuff's done. The cars were, I think the cars were gone the next day. Um, it, it really um, amazes you um, how quickly some of these things get done if they know there's a legitimate threat of jail time. But again, it is a court of compliance. Um, throwing them in jail doesn't get the problem solved. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it provides the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the fire to be lit under them to get it done. 
Um, and the, um, um, like I said, I, I think it's um, also appropriate deterrent to make sure they, they don't um, keep coming back. Um, my, again, our court is unique because typically when you put someone on probation, we've got a probation department um, that'll do the drug screens, make sure they're uh, complying with their counseling and all that. Since our court is so unique, you know, our typical probation officer in municipal court doesn't know housing code stuff. That's why um, the court has, by statute, a, a chief environmental specialist. Uh, Josh Harmon is, is my environmental specialist who's here today. Um, his, his goal, his job, one of his main jobs is to make sure that um, court orders are followed up on. And um, I, I, the case, case load is somewhere around 600 to 700 cases um, that he, um, he routinely has to go out and make sure the court's orders are followed up on, not only that the things are fixed, but that the properties are being maintained. Uh, recently, the court ordered a systematic review of the real estate holdings of one of its probationers. Uh, Mr. Skinner referenced this earlier. Uh, this individual had 31 properties. Um, and uh, so the inspection of these 31 properties has occupied uh, Josh's full attention and resources uh, for the past four days. Um, and I think he's doing a fantastic job and he's working with code enforcement on this, but you know, keep in mind, code enforcement doesn't work for the court. Um, they're often a party in the case. This is a unique situation that code is helping uh, Josh out on, but uh, typically it is, it is um, the probation department and, uh, and our environmental specialist that sees to it that the court orders are followed up on. Um, I, that, that's key. I, mean, I can make all the orders I want. If, if they're not being followed up on, and, and um, then, then it's not going to do us any good. So um, I think um, my job, I, like I said, I've been trying to run the most efficient courtroom as possible. And just to echo City Attorney Pfeiffer's concerns, that there, we want to make sure that although we do these things as quickly as possible, it is a court process. There is due process. You know, these are property owners. These are in there, and they have rights. And I want to make sure that their rights don't get, um, it's my job to make sure their rights are, 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 don't get trampled on the process of trying to get these things cleaned up. So once again, I, I thank you all um, for your support attention in this matter and to the city attorney and um, all the code enforcement officers for their help. So. Your Honor, thank you for taking the time to come down uh, today. Um, one thing that I learned in, actually it was Mark Ferencheck's reporting from the Columbus Dispatch, uh, is that your docket isn't solely comprised of environmental. You still have regular muni court duties. Can you touch upon that and maybe what that percentage is that you're not spending all of your time on what we would deem as housing issues? Sure. Um, the, I, I would say I, I still get somewhat of a regular municipal court docket, the OVIs, domestic violence cases. I'll get those usually one of two ways. Um, I still have to preside in arraignment court, um, and whenever there is a plea taken in that court in front of me, those cases stick with me. So if somebody comes in for an OVI in arraignment court, I'm in arraignment court, I'm going to have that person assuming their own you know, probation. The other way those cases come to me is, let's say someone is on probation of me for an environmental case already, and they pick up a, an OVI or, a, or an assault. Um, by single assignment, local rule, those cases come to me. So I still get the rest of the uh, municipal regular misdemeanor type cases that way. In addition to, again, the felony, um, some felony environmental crimes that the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office will bring to us. And, and can you touch upon um, how often uh, in your sentencing or in the terms of your sentencing or terms of probation, uh, you require code to allow internal entry into a property. Is that something that's regularly done? Is that is that not regularly done? Because one thing that's con yeah. that's concerning to me is uh, you know hearing about cases out in the community of 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 families that may be living in substandard conditions that are not gleaned from the facade of the property, but once you get in, it could be rat infested, mm -hmm. you know, cockroaches, lack of water. Um, so I'm wondering what, what tools do you have to, um, to make, to allow as sure. part as terms of probation or sentencing to allow internal access? Sure. Well, again, as Mr. Skinner pointed out, the, the best vehicle for that is, is having them on probation. It gives us much more leeway as to um, what um, our environmental specialist or, or code enforcement giving them uh, the tools to be able to do that if they're on probation. Is that is that a regular term of your probation or is that something that's generally an add-on? 
Uh, generally, a, a, a normal um, term of probation would require um, some uh, 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 an order to allow random inspections by code enforcement or the chief environmental specialist. So, so sure, absolutely. Okay, uh, Councilmember Mills, do you have any questions for the judge? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, I'd like to make an announcement that we're no longer going to be accepting speaker slips here in about a minute or two. So if you haven't filled out a speaker slip and you want to fill out a speaker slip, please uh, do so at the speaker slip box and maybe drop it off up here to John Oswald in the gray suit who's sitting behind Councilmember Mills who just raised his hand. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Betsy uh, Liska, who's the president of the Ohio Landlord Association, uh, to come to the podium and speak. I'm interested, I'm not as familiar with your organization, if you could talk about who you are and the uh, people you represent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having us. This is our sort of first introduction into city politics, if you will. Gretchen, thank you for reaching out and making sure we were here today. We, myself, um, specifically designed the Ohio Landlord Association for the reasons that we're sitting here or standing here today. There has never been a relationship between landlords and city officials before today. So my thought was, in doing this, that bringing landlords together, having a collective voice, and also hopefully an invitation to sit at the table when it comes to these types of discussions for the future is what we really want. We're none of us, um, we've been in, sort of, we launched in November, and we have a total of 640 members. I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but we estimate that there are 3,500 landlords that own property in Franklin County. We don't have an approximate number on how many rentals that makes. So 640 in two months, we're pretty proud of that number. Our idea is we want to make things better. We are trying to be good stewards of um, the community. Not every landlord is a bad one. Not every landlord has an LLC or is using it as a shield. Um, a lot of us do a lot of good, and a lot of us are actually in our neighborhoods and have a pretty good handle on what's going on. One of the things that we have strived to do and really would like to work to do is to build a relationship with the police department. We have a good idea of what's going on in the neighborhoods of our properties, and we have never ever been able to speak to a police officer in a unified way to say, this is an issue, what can we do? And the flip side of that is, if there are calls on my property, I am not actually notified. So if there are 10,000 calls to one of my units, I don't know that. So it's not as though I'm trying to be a bad landlord, but if I'm not informed, unless I'm going to the police department's website on a daily basis, I have no way of knowing that. So we want everyone to be able to make sure they're on the same page and the information is shared so that way everyone can work together in eliminating some of these problems. The one thing I did want to say is, I think as landlords and as community members, we have to be careful, especially about the Cincinnati ordinance. If you ask us to evict these tenants, and some of them are really, really um, difficult people, absolutely. If we evict them, where do they go? Are, is the next landlord actually a bad landlord for running to them as well? You're just moving the problem, right? Or else they end up in a different sort of system. So that's something we're open to talking about. We're opening to hearing whatever suggestions you guys have. We just want a seat at the table, and we would just really like to build relationships from this point forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, the 640 mm -hmm. uh, that you referenced, are those all Columbus, Central Ohio, or State of Ohio? Right now, we're Franklin County specific. So in 640 in Franklin County. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, have any idea of how many are in the city? Uh, everything, uh, I would say the majority of those owners, we have 2,500 properties right now. I would say probably 2,000 of those are in Franklin County in the city limits. So your 640 own 2,500 and 2,000 are in the city of Columbus? Rough numbers. Okay. Uh, thank you. Councilmember Mills. Two, two questions. And the Land, Ohio Landlord Association membership is individual landlords or LLCs who own property as well? Ah, here we go. <laughs> We're in the same boat with you guys. They can have an LLC but we are looking for specific members. So they may register an LLC, but they also have to register their name, which might be of help to some of you. So that's a yes? Yes, it is. Okay, so my other question is, you mentioned that not never notify, and I thought I heard from the city attorney's office that on certain 
offenses there's notification or others there's not if if the city attorney's office could address the not never no notified if, landlord comment if if there's been a drug buy in a premise the city will send a certified letter to the owner saying drugs have been purchased in your property we've had SWAT teams in our units we've had every scenario that you can imagine and not been notified always mm -hmm. That's all I have. Could I? Hey, Chuck. Clank, Clank, Clank. Can I ask a question? Uh, of course, okay. Council or uh, City Attorney. Your folks own residential real estate, right? They do. Are they all registered with the county auditor? They're supposed to be. Are, are they? I don't know that answer. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, that's actually a one good, more question. Yeah, of course, City Attorney. Um, we had conversations with some uh, landlords in Franklinton who contemplated the idea of voluntarily getting together holding themselves out as, quote, good landlords and putting themselves out as uh, good housekeeping seal of approval landlords. Do you, do you folks have some idea that you could market yourself as, we are the responsible landlords, we will guarantee you safe, habitable, uh, did you do that? Or you have that planned? We're working with um, like an Angie's List or whatever. We are. We're working with Volunteers of America right now on the homeless issues and trying to do that. And the other side of that is, we're actually trying to pilot a program where tenants would come through a class, if you will, on how to be a good tenant and what that means, paying your rent and taking oh. care of the property and how to do that. We know that historically speaking. A lot of tenants have actually been lifers in that system. That's, they've seen their parents be evicted. They've seen their grandparents. And they don't know necessarily what it means to take care of a property and be a good tenant. So in, in that respect, are you aware of an organization called Homes on the Hill? I'm not. You should contact them because they, in fact, are planning a program where they want to try to educate tenants also, as you do. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, if I might, do you educate your landlords as to good tenant screening and as to with some periodic, make sure you're checking your properties on a regular basis? We do. We talk a lot about um, the different resources that are available to our landlords, whether it be Fabco, whether it's a, a different you know, database that they want to use. Unfortunately, a lot of those systems don't work if a landlord doesn't report to it or if the information that's being pulled is inaccurate. Do you have a membership fee? We do. What is your fee? 125 for a year. Per year. Is that based on number of units or just whatever you got? Right. We are different from other associations in the fact we're not counting those numbers as part of your fee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, City Attorney. Uh, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do want to read because the City Attorney brought up uh, registration, and this is directly from uh, the Franklin County Auditor's Office. And it says, Dear Residential Property Owner, House Bill 294 and Substitute House Bill 119 uh, require an owner of residential property to file the information listed below, which is essentially a name, street address, etc., with the county auditor of the county in which the property is located. A rental property for these purposes is any residential property in which money is exchanged, meaning the unit is leased or otherwise rented to tenants solely for residential purposes. Um, so, as the city attorney noted, there is a requirement by the state of Ohio to register properties that uh, perhaps not all landlords are um, complying with. Um, the next speaker is uh, Tony Cunningham, the Director of Workforce Development, the Columbus Urban League. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein, Councilmember Craig, and Councilmember Mill. Councilmember Mills for having me here. Uh, I represent, as you mentioned, the Columbus Urban League, and within our organization, we do have a housing department. Um, our main role in terms of the subject that we're talking about here today is our fair housing department, where we look at monitoring for discrimination and also mediate landlord and tenant complaints and concerns. So when I, as I'm listening here today um, about the topic, when I think about the tenants, responsibilities and things like that. What we do is we coach them on responsible rental counseling, how they should manage properties and that type of thing, learning how to pay your rent on time. But we also mediate concerns that they have with their properties, you know, what's going on inside and, and how they can work through the process with the landlord, whether it means filing a complaint um, about their conditions, 
what's happening with their uh, monetary piece in terms of what the landlord has promised to do and to fix and how they can go about putting their rent in escrow and different things like that if they're having challenges. And so um, when I think about today's um, hearing, we do run into instances where there may be landlords who are having some challenges and we try to force from the tenant standpoint at least safe reliable living conditions that people can live in and then share with them what they can do if they're found if they find that the landlord is not responding to those concerns we do have mediation we do do um, these agreements that they are held to most often we find that we can get the landlords to work with us and honor those agreements, but we also share with our clients what they can do if the landlord does not honor the agreement that they've made in the mediation process. So that's what we do to try to mitigate that. We don't unfortunately provide supportive housing, which was another one of the questions that were asked of me, um, but we do provide lists of um, landlords and places where people can potentially go to obtain housing and then try to work with them through our other services about um, in terms of financially what they can do to get support to get better housing or different housing should they have to move. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Yes, Councilmember Mills. I have two questions. Uh, kind of what the city attorney would describe, which I would put in a conversation of sort of an accredited or approved or checked off type landlord. You all, th that type of service would be useful when you're hearing from a tenant knowing whether this landlord you've had previous encounters with that has been working with any, any other of your previous tenants. Do you all track landlords that you may have seen where you've received several tenant complaints and you know that they're not the easiest to work with and a list of those who are easy to work with that you hear about given the volume of tenants that you all work with? Well, um, unfortunately, given the nature of our business, we can't get into naming or approving because we could then be sued um, by the landlords themselves. What we do do is partner with the Better Business Bureau and we refer clients to check out the Better Business Bureau to find out if other complaints have been filed and if they can get kind of information around what's been going on, if they're having challenges. So that would be part of our coaching and counseling is, you know, you may want to check. I can't necessarily speak to that landlord's, um, you know, their conditions or the cases they've had previously, that, but I can refer you to the Better Business Bureau and advise that you maybe check it out that way and see what you come up with. Okay, my other question is earlier in the hearing, I'm not sure if you were present or not, um, we heard in earlier presentations that occasionally there are landlords that have owned multiple properties and they're sort of in over their heads, if you will, and fallen mm -hmm. on hard times. Have you encountered some of that in your work with the tenants and talking to landlords where there are just some landlords that are just in over their head, maybe only too, prop too many properties at one time, economy, that sort of thing? Would you say that you've heard some of those issues? No, um, not that specifically. Um, I would have to ask my team in terms of um, whether or not we have some reoccurring landlords, but I've not, we've not um, done anything as a whole or spotted any trends of the reoccurring landlords. It's usually onesie twosies and then the client themselves walks in voluntarily because they know that the Columbus Urban League has a fair housing department. And so when we're looking at behind the scenes, I can't say that we have like a, you know, somebody's name keeps popping up over and over again. And so that may be something going forward that we might want to track just so, just so we are clear about what's going on. No, no, I'm describing where we talked about where landlords from a financial standpoint can't keep up with certain conditions of the, of the house. So when a tenant has brought to you an issue, I don't know whether it's a, a sink repair or something like that, and the landlord is saying, I'm you know, financially not able to make those changes. Have you had those kind of situations where landlords have described to you financially they can't make the repairs or changes? We were discussing earlier that that is sometimes happening with landlords where they they themselves are financially they want to make the changes mm -hmm. they have the intentions but financially are not able to do so I'm sorry I misunderstood your question um, yes we do run into that especially in the in the um, in the world of foreclosure and people kind of um, having some challenges based on financial issues that have stemmed in the housing area over the past several years um, unfortunately we can't lay that at the tenants feet so we continue to tell them what their what they can do 
to press forward. Um, in terms of helping the landlord, we have in our housing department, we have foreclosure prevention and save the dream. And so we would um, check with them to see if maybe they need to go through that route to determine how to save their property, if at all possible, from foreclosure or any uh, financial challenges they might be having on that side of it. But um, when the client comes in to talk to us to have that case mediated, we're definitely working on behalf of the client and tell them what they can continue to do to press forward, even though we're sympathetic with the landlord's challenges. So working with both the landlords through one type of program and the tenants on the other. Okay, thank you. Right. Councilmember Craig. Thank you, uh, Chairman Klein. Uh, Ms. Cunningham, do you have a sense, given the state of the economy, the numbers of tenants and or landlords uh, that you are currently working with or have worked with, uh, you know, over the period of a year? Yeah, I do not have the actual hard numbers. I can tell you that our housing department, aside from workforce, is the busiest department in the Columbus Urban League. I know that we field over 1,200 calls a month. We see approximately, uh, we take walk-ins on Mondays and Tuesdays, and we see anywhere from, you know, 15 to 20 families in those two days that need rental counseling or support. Um, I can get you the hard numbers in terms of our report from last year of how many we actually served and mediated, how many of those cases actually made it to mediation. However, um, I know that we receive about 1,200 calls a month and probably about 20 to 25 walk-ins a week. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Pardon me. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Thank you. The next speaker is Lisa Boggs here, Ms. Boggs. Okay. The next speaker is Linda Henry. Southside Neighbors Against Crime. Please come forward, yes. Thank you for coming down, Ms. Henry. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm here on a different than what the other two ladies talked about. Our problem is tenant landlords that do not care. They don't care who they rent to. They don't care how bad their houses look. They just, as long as they get the rent, they're happy. We've got people right now living in houses that I wouldn't let a rat live in. I see this every day, either going north, south, east, or west. This is what we need to address, and I really do wish that we could find a way to get code officers into these deplorable houses to let them see how these people are living. These people are afraid to actually come forward and say anything for fear that they don't have any place else to go. So they will live there with malfunctioning electric, no heat, maybe a dribble for water. And these people need our help to get them back on their feet and get our neighborhoods back together again. And th that's all I have to say. We just need to do something, get more teeth for our code officers to be able to address these problems. And I want to thank you for adding more code officers too. But we, we've even got people that are LLCs, they never come out until the rent's due. By golly, they know where, that's when they say, oh yeah, I own that property. But you, you never see them, you never hear from them. We've got repeat uh, offenders that will sell to drug, I mean, rent to drug dealers all the time. They don't care who the drug dealer is. I've got one guy that has eight properties and every property has drug dealers in that property. One place got busted last September and he refuses to acknowledge anybody when they try to tell him what's going on. He gets nasty with you. This is something we need to stop also. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Henry. I appreciate it. Any questions for Ms. Henry? Thank you for coming down, Ms. Thank Henry. You. The next speaker is Joyce Hughes, Commissioner, uh, University Area, Wineland Park Civic. Thank you for coming down, Ms. Hughes. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk. I would like to say that Wineland Park, which is part of the University District, is going through the renovation and we're, we're revitalizing our neighborhood. Prior to that, we had vacant and abandoned houses. We have we still do. We had and have absentee landlords. We had LLCs. We had homes that were in foreclosure and the homes were owned by somebody overseas. 
we had all of those problems when we started the Civic Association and we're trying to work through our challenges and have our plan. And with the aid of the Collaborative and the City of Columbus, coming to our assistance when we asked them to come. We, we've been able to make some changes, some improvements. We still have challenges. As far as code is concerned, a frustration for me is that the code officer cannot go into the, the home unless invited. And that is something that we try to let all of our neighbors know. If you have a problem, don't complain about your landlord. And you can't run around and do like Joyce does. You cannot call them slum landlords because that is not politically correct. There is a way to manage that. However, my neighbors are, as Linda said, concerned and scared because my neighbors are part of the problem as well. And uh, when they're destroying the property, when they are not paying the rent on time, when they are doing things that are not within the limits of the law, they do not want a lot of attention brought to them, which gives a landlord a little frustration. Why should I fix up a place and try to maintain if the people I rent to are going to tear it up and destroy it. So there's, there are two sides to, to the situation, and I think the best way for us as neighbors, best way for us to manage that is through the process that, that our, our attorney uh, speaks to. There is a process for everything. You need to follow the rules. You need to follow the process. You need to get in touch with the city officials who will be more than happy to give you the information. I have listened to the people behind me and they've been more than willing to give too much information just so that we can have something to work with. In the Civic Association, we have a housing committee. In the housing committee, I directed the housing committee to have a landlord subcommittee. That is for us to reach out to the landlords. And when we reached, we got some challenges. We've had the aid of our collaborative. We've had Steve Dunbar come and, and talk with us. And unfortunately, I, I, I do disagree with people. If, if the landlord has someone in his property who is disturbing and tearing up and my neighbors are afraid to walk in front of their house, I want you to kick them out, period. It is your responsibility as the landlord to provide my neighborhood with decent residents. I don't care where they go. They've got problems, that's their problem. So those are things that we in Wyland Park are working on with the aid and assistance of the University Area Commission and our president is sitting back next to me and I'm glad to see her today. We try to work on situations so that we can bring the people to the table, have the discussion and see what, what best practices there have been, what can we do to move this thing forward. Is that what you wanted me to talk about? And thank you're you doing a great job. All right. Keep talking as long as you'd like. Are you, are you finished? Okay. Uh, Mr. Rose, um, just something that's kind of been a, uh, a theme that we've heard a couple times about deplorable conditions inside the property. Am I out on a limb to say that if there's deplorable conditions inside the property, then chances are there is an exterior code violation? Is that fairly common? I mean, I'm not saying 100% of the time, but I'm saying generally would they be linked? A lot of times it goes together, yes. Okay. Okay. That's, I was just curious about that. Um, the next speaker is Lucy Wolf, Commissioner, uh, Livingston Area, Livingston Avenue Area Commission. Good evening, Chairman Klein, Council Member Mil uh, Mills, Councilman Craig, City Attorney Pfeiffer. Um, I'm here today to speak as a community leader and a real estate professional who is familiar with the challenges that set the precedence for this hearing. 
It has been my experience that vacant properties are an easy mark for burglary, vandalism, drug dealers, and squatters. Over time, even animals in all forms will become an inhabitants as well. If there are any such architectural items of value in a property, such as clawfoot tubs, stained glass, and fireplace mantles, you can be sure they will be stolen. The longer the property sits, especially if it's not maintained to code, the more the market value begins to deteriorate, dragging down its value and the values of the homes around it. We realtors face a difficult challenge when a seller lives next door to an eyesore. How can we market a property or place a realistic sale price on a listing next to a vacant building? There are realtors who list properties at prices below the value of the delinquent property taxes and who do not find out if there are liens or judgments attached to the parcel they are trying to sell. This pre presents a problem at closing and often can break a sale. We need to have some realtors be educated on how to best advocate for their clients. Foreclosure is another problem for sellers. If their realtor is unfamiliar with negotiating with lenders, banks have no heart in almost all of the foreclosure cases. Sometimes they even drop proceedings if the value of the house is determined to not be worth the legal fees to seize the property. The owner of record is then stuck with the lien, often can't sell the property for the cost of the mortgage. Most of the time, taxes are also not paid and this puts the owners in a state of limbo. In contrast, there are many properties conveyed to new owners that transfer without the payment of taxes. In the case of rental properties, the landlords facing problems with tenants have not done their homework and background checks. Letting tenants live in property without paying rent only escalates the landlord's problems. Those tenants that become a detriment to the neighborhood should be the landlord's responsibility as well. Perhaps charging the nuisance property owner for police runs is another way to get them to put better people into their rentals. I've also seen landlords who let the property sit uninhabited as it goes to foreclosure. Perhaps those landlords in trouble should be asked to notify city officials that there is a problem and seek assistance if, instead of walking away. Should the offender pay fines higher than $500? I say yes, they should be comparable to the ones in Cleveland that, that are 2,000. Should the threat of jail time be strengthened? Yes, of course. I think that special attention also should be paid to our city historic districts to facilitate better preservation. Encouraging property owners to comply with city codes help keeps the city budget in check. Better neighborhoods mean less crime, fi fires, and need for code enforcement. Thank you, Chairman Klein. Thank you, Councilman Craig, Councilmember Mills, Attorney Pfeiffer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wolf. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to proceed to the uh, public commentary, and and I have, we have 11 speaker slips, so a couple of housekeeping orders. I, I want to go on the record of saying that um, I flipped through the speaker slips, and there's a lot of community leaders in here and, and uh, that are going to offer some interesting and, and uh, uh, important testimony. Uh, because of, um, obviously when we invited some speakers from different parts of town, like simply it's unmanageable and unwieldy to invite every community leader. Um, so we are going to limit the public testimony to three minutes. Um, I envision this giving um, the turnout, giving the testimony given the concerns raised, this being the first of many conversations on this issue, and there'll be plenty of time to talk at further length. If, uh, if you feel like you need to talk more than three minutes at some point, obviously you can always contact council chambers, or council offices. Um, the second housekeeping order is that I do have a development and rec and parks hearing that's slated to start in four minutes. We have 11 speakers at three minutes each, it's easy math, um, that the development and rec and parks hearing will be postponed until we're finished with this and then we'll immediately go in we'll maybe have a, a restroom break but immediately go into development and rec and park so i if you're here for the development rec and parks hearing the benches are uncomfortable but don't we will not be offended if you step out in the hallway or seek a softer seat um, but i would appreciate um your patience um as we as we plow through these speakers to make sure that the folks that have sat here get the opportunity to speak um, the first speaker is jeffrey phillips And these are these are time stamped, and the or you'll be called in the order that's received that we received them. 
Three minutes, sir. If you could state the name and the organizations you represent. I'm Jeffrey Phillips, 45 South Eureka Avenue, um, Highland West Neighbors Association, the older section of the hilltop. I think it's important what we do first here is we, we delineate the type of landlords we're actually talking about. There are many landlords who collect property and they collect this property to hold that property and trust to rent that property out for that property to increase in value, such as a trust you would leave to your children or something like that. Then there's the other type of landlord that watches late night TV and buys books like this, How to Make a Million Dollars in Real Estate in Three Years Beginning Now. That's what we're talking about. LLCs, whether it's a corp, whether it's an individual, or a trust in these situations, they always have managers. More time than not, these managers are not legally licensed in the state of Ohio because they are not realtors. But it's a good front, it's a good fence to say, ask the manager, I know nothing about it. Standards, I've always had a, this problem with Section 8 standards and everyone else's standards for real estate. Those real estate standards should be the same regardless of if you're renting on a Section 8 voucher or whether you're actually just renting a property as an individual. Another party to get involved in this could be our representatives in the federal government. Vouchers should pay market rent, so they do not unnecessarily drive rents up in neighborhoods which force actual working people out of those neighborhoods. And vouchers need to be treated as cash. And it should be discrimination to not take one, because they are cash. But leaving that aside, <laughs> speaking from the perspective of someone like myself, I live among these people that are rented to, okay? We're talking about criminals, dope dealers, prostitutes, chasing regular residents out, many of whom have lived in those neighborhoods for all their lives. Some were dealing with third and fourth generations, now leaving the neighborhood. So yeah, the tenants are a big issue, but who approves those tenants? To have any legislation which does not give me, a private individual, the ability to sue a landlord for damages, on damages he should or she should have known about before renting that individual, would also be part of a good solution to the problem. You can go to Fabco. One to 51 units is what we're talking about. $25 annual membership fee. Don't run the credit because we all know it's going to be bad anyway, right? That's what my friend landlords always say. Well, run the other three things, sex offender, criminal background, and rental history. $13.50. I understand many feel they're doing the work of the Lord and everything else I've heard about. But they're unwilling to do the work of the Lord by renting to people who are unable to be placed. Well, I say do that work of the Lord in your community. Do it in Dublin. Do it in Arlington. Do it in Worthington. Do it next door so you can be a part of rehabilitating that renter to become a decent, respectable citizen in our community. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Any questions for Mr. Phillips? Thank you. James Flannery, Franklin Park Civic. You could just could restate your name and address if you're representing an organization. You have three minutes. Thank you, members of council. I'm James Flannery. I'm president of the Franklin Park Civic Association. I don't want to exceed my time. There are many things that I could discuss related to this topic. Um, I'd like to begin with the adage that the first impression is the last impression. The Near East has been plagued with the burden of blight and vacant and abandoned properties. This has gone on far too long. It has been amplified by the housing market crash. Just one aspect with these problem properties is uh, that council has taken steps to address is graffiti abatement. Um, the attempts to address this situation with graffiti have been inadequate because they only deal with occupied structures. Um, we have many that are not occupied. Um, commercial and residential properties that are covered in graffiti. Um, not only does this play a role in encouraging crime, it reinforces negative perceptions of our communities and disregards the investments of years of hard work by our dedicated residents to revitalize our neighborhoods. One property, the trolley burnt complex at Kelton and Oak, has been in non-compliance with an environmental court order since 2005. That is outrageous. Uh, community efforts brought the attention to 
the situation not code enforcement. And the myriad troubles came to light through residents to abate graffiti. Once in court again, the city attorney requested that the judge not appoint a receiver, although the judge was prepared to do so. This action contributed further to the decay of this property, which was instrumental in settling of our neighborhood in the, early, the late 1900 and early 20th, 20th century. This property remains in the hands of its current owner, who was found to be in contempt of court, for an additional year without making adequate attempts to remedy legitimate health and safety concerns or to take steps to preserve the historic structures. It's vital that the city develop a means to prioritize key neighborhood properties for coordinated and well-articulated efforts with a clear track to resolution. Other situations such as the Main Street grain silos continue to endanger our citizens and further inflict harm and reinforce perceptions that negative Im negatively impact our efforts to revitalize. The fact that there is little potential use for these silos does not change the fact that they threaten our health and safety. The City of Columbus must recognize the importance of devoting resources to promote affordable revitalization of our housing stock found south of Maine. However, I cannot stress strongly enough that addressing problem properties must be balanced with careful attention to the preservation of the historic fabric of our neighborhoods. Rather than mass demolition of our communities, some of these situations could be improved by holding property owners accountable, by adequately securing and mothballing properties, or perhaps minimally with a bucket of paint. I invite council to meet with me and to tour our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Next speaker is Deborah Supalak. Supalak. Apologies if I missed that. Thank you for coming to council. Three minutes. If you just could identify yourself, make sure I said your name correctly, any uh, organizations you represent in your address. Thank you. I'm Deborah Supalak. I'm here from 415 East Maynard Avenue, and I am a member of the SOHUD Block Watch south of Hudson in the northern corner of the University District. But I'm speaking on my, my behalf and that of some of my neighbors, both homeowners and some of them landlords as well. Um, our concerns are that the issue of landlord accountability is something we feel very keenly in our area where we have rental properties that run on some blocks from 90% of the houses rental properties up to about 40% rental properties. Um, if my homeowner neighbor is engaging in some kind of activity that is uh, causing a decline of the quality of the living in the neighborhood, I can go directly to them and address them for it. Many times we find that the homeowner or the property owners are not reachable by any means whatsoever. I know you read the code before about the Outerders website. That's not maintained, apparently, nor is it, um, there seems to be any kind of enforcement. I can go on there and I can find just an, a single name, no address. I can find people who ha owned that property three owners ago, still listed. It, there doesn't seem to be any checks and balances to make sure that that's updated, which means that residents like myself aren't able to begin the process, uh, whether it's calling through 311, whether it's reaching out to a landlord that we know is having problems. Um, the, our representative from the R Landlords Association talked about not knowing that there were crime going on in her neighborhood. I guarantee if she came down to the neighborhood, if she met the people who are actually living there, she'd know about that crime. I think that we've left out the possibility of neighbors being a partner in this whole process. That. Um, there, we're talking very much about code enforcement, we're talking about courts, but um, neighbors are the eyes and ears, and we can be the first feet on the ground if we were given the tools to actually affect any kind of change. The uh, updated website of the property owner being one. Um, I, our issue, our primary issue is with absentee landlords, um, both individuals and LLCs, um, we have suggested remedies, perhaps there could be some review of property taxation that is set according to the distance between the property owned and the home of the home uh, property owner. Um, I don't know the legalities of that, I leave that up to you, but it would encourage ownership closer to the property itself, um, which I think would help to build the neighborhood 
that's one of the things that I know City Council and the Mayor has talked about, revitalizing and improving neighborhoods. Um, it seems to me too, as we've tried to resolve some issues in our neighborhood, that there's excessive separation of enforcement roles between zoning, building, and code enforcement. Um, one department um, has oversight of one area, but they know nothing about, for example, what's going on inside the house afterwards in terms of living conditions, not just mechanical problems. We have people living in attics and basements in other unsafe conditions that needs to be addressed in this as well. I will continue my comments on another format. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Council Member Mills. I, I don't know if, if you were away from the microphone at the time, but I couldn't quite, you were re referencing that there's a lack of checks and balances in the system. What system were you referring to? Um, I don't recall saying that. I was talking about the separation of enforcement roles between zoning. No, 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 no. Earlier, when you first started up, you started talking about the information not being updated, having outdated. Yeah, the system? auditor website. Auditor when website. I, yeah, okay, that's what auditor I could, website. I couldn't hear you. I think you had stepped away from the microphone a little bit, so I couldn't hear you. The auditor's website. Okay. My other question was, I know that um, we heard from Joyce Hughes in terms of how they, as a civic association, manage and have a housing subcommittee and all of that. And it just struck me to ask this question, and you may not have an answer, but I am curious about the attendance to civic association meetings or commission, area commission meetings that we would find landlords attend and or that tenants get just as welcome, whether they're homeowners or not, to engage in that process for uh, working together. To your point, the rubber meets the road with the neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that kind of struck me wondering, is there conversation or opportunity and how that engagement works with landlords and tenants related to area commissions and civic association? If you have any comments on this, great. If you don't, I understand. But it just struck me when you mentioned that whole piece and thinking about the conversation that we heard from with Joyce Hughes. Right, well, and Joyce and Doreen can answer perhaps more at length. In, the, um, in my small little portion of the university district, we've just recently started up a, a, kind of a block watch that also serves some of the purposes of a civic association. We are reaching out to landlords to try and bring them in on these kind of issues as well as crime related issues. And we are also very actively involved in um, attending the commission meetings. Our commission um, within the university district, there's something called the university district organization that has a uh, group called the University Community Business Association that is supposed to be creating a dialogue between residents and businesses in the uh, area, including landlords. We do have a um, representative on our University Area Commission re um, representing landlords specifically. And, and so there are, I think, opportunities for dialogue, um, but we're finding that, our, again, our hands are tied because at a certain point, when we try to move forward with code enforcement, the officers tell us, well, we can't go in the house because we don't have the rights to go in. Um, we uh, don't have the opportunity to change this zoning regulation that needs city council to act on that. You know, we're, we're, finding, we're finding that we're up against certain walls. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is, is uh, Belska Schoenballs. Belskis, I'm sorry, I but yes, I mispronounced both your first and last name. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Belkis Schoenhals, and I'm representing <laughs> Homes on the Hill. Our address is 3659 Soldano Boulevard, and um, we work primarily in the Hilltop and Westland areas. And um, the reason I'm speaking this evening is I wanted to advocate our support of the efforts that you're trying to do to address these issues with these blighted properties and absentee landlords. Um, we're hoping in 2014 to establish LEAN, which is the Landlord Engagement Action Network. And that will be a network of responsible landlords that we can engage with tenants and also have um, classes for both landlords and tenants to, um, to teach them you know, the responsibilities that they have in their role. 
Um, and we would love to collaborate with any community leaders and local entities to um, make that happen. But, you know, simply I just, I wanted to advocate our support and thank you for starting the conversation and um, for addressing the issue. So, thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Of course, of course, city attorney. Uh, you might want to talk to this woman walking out the door. She said she never heard of your organization. She's trying to do the same stuff you are, the Ohio Landlords Association. Yeah. Right there. You got to talk to this person. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, city attorney. Thank you, Belkis. Okay, thank you. The next speaker is Jeremy Graham. He had to leave? Okay. James Johnson. Mr. Johnson. <coughs> With the Driving Park Civic Association, if you just could identify your address, and you have three minutes, sir, as soon as you're ready to go. Yes, sir. My name is Jim Johnson. I'm president of the Driving Park Civic Association, and I live at 1084 Berkeley Road, Columbus, Ohio. Mine's will be very short to Chairman Klein, Chairman Craig, Chair Lady Mills, Judge Hawkins, and a Tony Pfeiffer. So mine will be very short, but I can say this. My reason for being here is three C's, communication, coordination, and cooperation. I do not have a complaint, but my job as the chairperson is to do the job in the neighborhood and we take care of the complaints at the first level. So I'm just glad to be down here and that to be here. Any, anything I can do to help. I'm very proud of the team that we have here. And, and Judge Hawkins, uh, we got some good reports on you, so I'm glad of that. You can help out uh, Tony Fife, of course. Your name, once you get in a position, you, your name will be out there before you show up. But, but we are glad to have you here. And I think with the team here, we will do some great things. So that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Appreciate right. it. Any questions or comments? For... Thank you, sir. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Peter Ellencove. Again, with the Driving Park Civic Association. If you just could identify yourself. Uh, and you Reverend three Peter Elenko. I live at uh, 1030 Gears. I'm a new member to the community. Now this makes my first year and a half. Thank you, Chair Klein, Chair Mills, distinguished people. Mine is just an observation. I've heard a great deal from many of the people here who are well versed into the legalities that are about. I've been attending Hope Lutheran Church on Lily my concern is, one, that there are 12 abandoned houses between Mooberry and Livingston. Of those houses, five of them are burnt, they're torched, they're unlivable, and yet they are still there. I've been poking around trying to figure out who or what owns them or how they, uh, how they can be contacted to no avail, whether they are LLCs or other kind of uh, um, vaporous individuals makes very little concern. My concern is the blight that is there in the community, one that is a part of the, the church, the people that are there in the congregation that come and observe this. The number of prostitutes that habit the corner of Lily and Livingston that seem to walk back and forth that are there. These are sorry individuals, and I feel for them. As a pastor, I try to reach out to them. However, there are a great deal of things that are beyond my ability to reach out. My concern here is just the, if it's draconian in terms of taking away properties from, uh, from people, these properties are abandoned. Nobody is taking care of them. No one is doing anything. Whether people are sitting on them, waiting for the prices to increase and then unload them, okay. But they're a blight. They're a serious issue in terms of vermin that are there, in terms of children that could be playing there and being endangered. 
that's my concern. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, if you, John or Gretchen, connect with the Reverend about the, the five addresses that you specifically mentioned, and we'll look into those. Uh, we have a VAP process, vacant and abandoned property team. Those properties very well could be on the list. They may or may not. I, I don't know. Well, one of the, the things that uh, I, through the uh, Civic Association, have been bringing them forward, and we have looked to see how we can do them, but I would be more than glad to. Be happy to, to coordinate with you to yes, get on the. Oh, please. thank you, sir. Uh, the next speaker speaker is uh, Edward Hammy Hahn. <laughs> Hamilton, Hammy Hahn. It looks like a I Hammy like Hahn, but Hamilton, just, okay, yeah. Pen was out of ink. <laughs> My name is Edward Hamilton and I live at 98 Hosack Street down in the Reeve Hosack neighborhood. We were just finished our celebration with the neighborhood pride. And I had asked the mayor when he was giving a speech about the landlords, and he said, the city can't do anything about it, it's majorly, majorly state law. Well, I know that for a fact, because I just finished, concluded a three-year legal battle against the landlord for rightful enjoyment to my property. Everyone's speaking, the landlords are speaking, the tenants are speaking, how about the neighbors? I mean, really, we have rights to. And that should be balanced against the other three. It cost me $10,000 to abate a nuisance from, my, from the landlord next door to me. I'm doing, I can talk about the lawsuit now because it's concluded. When I ran a property run for police calls, 72 in one year for a series of six units. I believe City Attorney Pfeiffer remembers this suit. He was also in the dispatch. And I had to put up with that because the t uh, landlord did not do the proper checking. But <clears throat> that's not e probably not even in counting the 311. Linda was talking about someone with eight units. The same landlord had six units with me. I had 70, and then I ran their properties. They had 110 calls in one year. How much in city resources is it costing for that? And should not, should not th that landlord be assessed for those resources being used by the city? At 100 bucks a pop, that's a lot of money. Um, he was also an LLC. I ain't having trouble finding him after filing in court. Filed it with the statutory agent. Oh, I got a call from him then. Three years, back and forth. A property owner shouldn't have to do this. And as far as the LLCs are concerned, the IRS is a perfect source of information. If they violate a law, you can get the information because you'll be sure they claim it on their taxes. The county commissioners can also help with this in the deed registration process. They can get information on the LLC before recording. Shouldn't be no problem there. The, the residential re, uh, property registration is a joke. Maybe 30, 40 uh, percent. Also, too, with the uh, banks and LLCs, there's a lot of them that the banks aren't accepting responsibility after the sheriff's sale. It's just not recorded because they don't want to pay the taxes or the fines. So you could do that as well. And all, one last thing was uh, <coughs> Section 8 subsidies. There's a covenant in Section 8 for the respect of neighbors, and it's not being enforced. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next speaker is Dewey Stokes. Welcome, Commissioner. Chairman Mr. Klein, Councilman, Councilman, thank you for holding these meetings and continuing to bring to the public's attention the problems that we have. 
and as has been said tonight, some landlords are not all bad landlords. Uh, I have about 15 pieces of property in Franklinton and have combined with the Franklinton Landlord Association in our attempt to bring the properties up to safety and health standard and the zoning code with the assistance of the city zoning and code people who have uh, done a, a good job in our area in trying to identify homes. Not making it, uh, it it's perfect, but uh, I would not rent a home that I would not sleep in on the floor the night before I rented it. I have one vacancy right now. I've went through 25 applications for that house, uh, and we still don't have applicants because of pending criminal violations, drug violations, and uh, evictions uh, by those who have made, filled out applications. Uh, keeping up with the tenant uh, after a place is rented is a problem in cases. Uh, I don't rent to Section 8 after most recent problem I had where a Section 8 uh, tenant brought in bed bugs and fleas and it cost us between seven dollars to $9,000 to uh, clean that up and to remove that. And I'd spend an additional four dollars or $5,000 uh, fixing the house up. I'm working on a current issue with the landlord, uh, unbeknownst to the landlord at this point, uh, with a tenant who is, uh, has a wife who's pregnant, and this house should not be on the market, should not be rented. The inside of this house is deplorable. It should uh, be vacated and be torn down uh, at its present condition. From the exterior, it looks good. From the interior, the city wall, the walls, of, the ceiling has fell in. Uh, I'll give you an example. Last month, this tenant is in a PIC program, spent 5,000, or had 5,000 kilowatt hours expended into this house. That should send a notice to PIC that something is wrong with the furnace or something's wrong with the house. Well, when you go in the, the house, the furnace is in deplorable condition. The, the pipes are down, but the big thing was the, the basement wall where the uh, window belongs is filled in with block, but the block is not covered, and the block just sends the air completely through the block, uh, the cinder block. Uh, th these are conditions that uh, we have fought against in Franklinton and continue to fight against, and I'm proud to say that there's some of the areas that the uh, city attorney mentioned tonight that uh, Homes on the Hill is taking a, uh, a proactive attitude towards setting up a landlord association there also and helping educate landlords. But I think that there are some other things that they, some of the uh, city elements could use, and that is monitoring the PIC program and the adult protection people should be out protecting some of these people. The individuals I'm currently involved with are both um, uh, have uh, mental health problems and are, I think are being taken advantage of by the landlord and the individuals involved in this case, and I plan on pursuing it in the weeks ahead. In the weeks ahead. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, I think there's much more to be discussed on this issue in the future, and I hope that you'll pursue this. And uh, I'm glad to hear that you're going to allow at least eight more inspectors. I think that uh, they're certainly needed. And following through with the police, the police issue I'm familiar with, if people want to help the police and they got drug dealers in their neighborhood, jot down the license numbers of those cars get the names of those individuals and forward them to the police department. That would be a further assistance of ridding the neighborhood of some of these individuals also. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, for letting me. Sage advice, Mr. Stokes. Thank you for offering that. Uh, our final speaker is Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins. <coughs> Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to Council. Uh, you'll have three minutes once you start speaking. Thanks. 1612, Lothian George Wilkins. Chair Minnesota Vacant Embedment Property in the North Linden area. I'd like to bring to your attention uh, three critical issues here. Um, liability, LLCs. There's several property in the North Linden area that have delinquent Tax, tax owners not paying their property tax. Last night, I got on my computer and looked at uh, five properties in the Linden area beyond Myrtle Avenue. This property located at 2403 Linden Avenue, parcel number 01 06 
0-800-242-0800-0800-0900. Property tax has not been paid. Standard balance is $10,522.61. How long do these properties unpaid tax can sit in out of lines? We have another property in the lending area, a uh, 19 unit apartment complex. This be on Western Railroad. And the fees for this like $51,000. And I'm speaking about 2722 on Western Road. How long has that property had, have to sit like that in bad condition. I want to bring to your attention VIP that list. By me traveling to Milo Grogan and other parts of the North Linden area and South Linden area, 1064 Peters Avenue, siding has been stolen, broken windows, broken in multiple times, and your taxes has not been paid. How long residents other communities, it's got to sit and, and see this. We just don't understand. I'm a resident of Arlington Avenue, visit my mother and my little Grogan. I grew up in that neighborhood. Right, right next door to my mother is a vacant property where a deceased property owner had died up in the house, and later was his wife. That property is still standing today as siding has been stolen and a porch has been burned. That's right next door to my mother. I want to bring to your attention a 1658 or Arlington Avenue. I walk past this property every day, just shaking my head, coming out of the city council. Siding has been stolen. The garage has been falling in and caving in and it's still standing today. And it still look like this, but I know we have multiple discussions on this, and I'll say when the next couple meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, uh, for that uh, commentary. Uh, we're now at the closing remarks portion of the agenda. Uh, Councilmember Craig, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Chairman Klein. Uh, I want to personally thank uh, uh, all of the, uh, the residents, the participants tonight, it's been, um, it's been a room full of persons, certainly interested parties, uh, property owners. Um, we certainly have got a, a legal, uh, a very clear, I believe, um, uh, assessment and overview by our city attorney and staff. I want to certainly appreciate their ongoing work uh, in this, and certainly the area commissions and civic associations. Uh, what I'm hearing, you know, there is a very delicate balance, uh, but one that we've got to be able to work through um, with the, the, the issue of due process, uh, and uh, certainly um, making sure that we're looking at chronic um, nuisance properties and how do we get there. Uh, and my sense is, is going to take all of those elements. The, the neighborhoods uh, are critical and vital. They're, they're on the ground. The civic associations, the area commissions, the neighbors that live in the neighborhoods that's directly affected uh, by the issues and the challenges. The renters have a responsibility, certainly, to, to, this, uh, to this mix. Uh, where there are legal remedies, we've got to look at those clearly, uh, sensibly um, understanding and respecting the rights of others, but at the same time, the rights of the neighbors and the community. So uh, I appreciate you uh, involving us in this uh, very serious dialogue. You've already said that uh, this is going to be ongoing discussion and we need to have it. But I appreciate you opening the door and certainly uh, uh, Councilmember Mills in asking very pointed and uh, uh, directed questions around this area. We've got work to do, but this is work we must do uh, because it's, it's, it's without it, uh, we certainly cannot lose our central city, many of these areas where people live, where children are, 
uh, and it affects all of our communities no, where, no matter where you are. Failure to look at these issues in a critical way and arrive at a decision that is, that is helpful for all of our families and our children. So thank you very much for the hearing today. Thank you, Council Member Craig. Council Member Mills. Thank you, Council Member Klein. I just have a few uh, closing remarks. Tonight was a, a night to learn and listen. And I certainly uh, see us both continue to do just that, listen and learning while looking at some actions and some things we can implement to make the changes. As I continue to refer back and forth between liquor objections and this, nuisance itself is, is tough. A nuisance is tough to narrow down, is tough to define, is tough to get a handle around. And so that experience with the liquor objection certainly helps to put this in scope when aligning those two issues together because it's just as impactful for neighbors, the owners, and customers. So there's stakeholders around both issues. And the importance of the neighbors in this role continues to be just that, extremely important. Hearing from our citizens and our residents continues to be important, but their actions, working through their civic associations, being present, attending area commission meetings, all of that is also required as it is being heard. Want to hear and listen to everyone, but certainly want action to match some of that in terms of engagement through the venues that we have currently in terms of commissions and civic associations. So I want to continue to encourage that as well as I try to share with folks when they're talking about problem establishments and with permit holders for liquor rejections. Make sure you thank those who are doing well uh, and, and not thank them because that's what they should do anyway, but recognizing that they are modeling the behavior that you would like to see of a neighbor in addition to talking about those who are creating challenges or nuisances in your neighborhood because when you highlight what the behavior is that you're looking for, you might build a culture of expectation within the neighborhood. So it's kind of the both and not an expectation or a culture of complaints, but a culture of this is what we expect in a neighbor. And I wanna to continue to encourage that work from all of the citizens through our area commissions and our civic associations that we do a little bit of both, that there's balance in all of it that requires all of the citizens and the residents to be active in both sides of it, the complaining side, notifying us of the challenges, but also in building a culture in your neighborhood of an expectation of good behaving landlords and tenants, both. So again, I want to continue the listening and the learning, but I want to encourage action for all. And that's both city council and what we can do, neighbors, tenants, and landlords. We all have to put in the action as well as continue to listen and learn about what we can do about this. I know nuisance can be an aggravating experience when you're living next to troubled tenants and or landlords. I understand it and hope that we can do something to address it. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mills, and thank you, Councilmember Craig, for joining us. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Department of Development, the Department of Building and Zoning Services, the City Attorney's Office and his staff, as well as Judge Hawkins and his staff for taking the time and coming and speaking to us today. Uh, members of the community that came, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It was insightful um, and invaluable. And uh, my, my takeaways are, you know, as we, as we move forward in, uh, in tackling these issues and identifying what needs to be done, is we have three silos. We, we essentially have like problem properties internal, which are the tenants. We have prom problem properties external, which are the landlords, building compliance, building quality and code compliance. And then we have vacant abandoned properties and LCs. And, and as, as we look at what we want to do, whether we want to change the law, how do we change the law, how do we redirect resources, um, those are intertwined, but yet they're distinctly separate. And the way that I'd like to, to approach laws and regulation is um, from, a, from a, a standpoint where we institute the most effective law that accomplishes the goal that we want to reach, but not be overburdensome in regulation to many of these small businesses that are the landlords. Uh, and it's become abundantly clear to me through the testimony that, uh, and it's something that I suspected, that a vast majority of landlords in the city are good actors. They're good people. A vast majority of the tenants in the city are good people. They're good actors. And we're talking about uh, some bad eggs. 
and how do we identify who those bad eggs are eggs are and how do we hold them accountable and I can tell you just from the testimony today that uh, frankly um, I, I think really the the person who's holding the power here and who's really the crucible in the situation is Judge Hawkins uh, because um, when, when the bad eggs get in front of you you know under the current tools that we have uh, you have the ability to hold them accountable and you have the ability um, to to really you know, direct the change that's needed to abate the nuisance and use the tools that are currently in our code. And I'm not suggesting that our tools are, are perfect and we, we can stop the hearings, we don't need to have any more and we're adequately uh, regulated because I don't think that. I think there are some holes in the system that we need to address. Um, but even under the current law, uh, using the carrots and sticks, um, uh, you know, the environmental court plays an important part uh, of how we're gonna move forward and hold these these bad actors accountable. Because at the end of the day, um, speaking on behalf of myself and I'm sure my council colleagues, the most important thing that we're focusing on is the quality of life of residents in our neighborhoods. That is the most important thing. Uh, and we must ensure that that quality of life is at its maximum, um, not at its minimum. And it's at its minimum when you're living next to a property or on a street um, where there is a problem property uh, or there's problem tenants or there's vacant and abandoned housing. Um, so that's the discussion as I see it moving forward. I appreciate everyone taking their time uh, to come to today's hearing um, and we'll take a two minute break and immediately go into our development and recreation and parks budget hearing which you're all welcome to stay for. Thank you. <laughs>